Greetings everyone, Jason Zelda here with the next one in the video series. This one's entitled Answering the Atheist video number one. We're going to be dealing with some issues here. I decided I would uh, go on YouTube and just sort of search out some videos and I just simply wanted to find some videos put together by atheists who were simply asking Christians questions. I'm not looking for a fight, I'm not looking for a debate or an argument or anything like that. I just simply wanted to find an honest hearted atheist that was genuinely wanting answers from Christians. What I kept running into though was a whole bunch of videos of Christians being attacked, the Bible being attacked, my God being attacked, my faith being attacked, my King James Bible being misrepresented over and over again, a vast misunderstanding of the scriptures. and. I just could not seem to find a video where it was just simply asking questions. Some of the videos had profanity in it. I don't want any profanity on my channel. So ultimately I had to settle for this video. It's called 10 questions every intelligent Christian must answer. So I decided to give it a spin and see what it's about. Let me give you a little background about this video first of all. In this video, the gentleman is reading from a website called God is Imaginary. So right from the very start, we're dealing with this concept that, to this person at least, he believes that God is imaginary. Therefore, the questions that he presents, he's presenting it in such a way as to convey that. The questions are designed to destroy your faith. And with the same kind of religious fervor that we Christians try to bring people to Jesus, there are some atheists who use that same kind of religious fav uh, fervor to remove people from the faith, to steer people from the scripture. So what I wanted to simply do is to give an honest answer for the questions that are being asked. The way he does it, though, is this. He asks a question. He gives an emotional response to the question. And then he gives what he says is the Christian's response. So if you have an atheist giving what is supposed to be the Christian's response, then you could expect that we Christians are going to be made to look stupid, dumb, ignorant, backward. You name the term, we're going to be made to look bad. And that is exactly how the video is put together. In many cases, when he's claiming to quote the Christian response, he'll even put it in quotes. What I wanted to do was I simply wanted to give an honest Christian response to the gentleman's questions. Now I don't want to drag the video out too long. So what I'm going to do is maybe answer the first five or six questions and then go ahead and post this to YouTube. If you guys are interested in hearing me answer any more questions, just leave some questions down there in the comment section. If you want me to finish answering his other questions, I can go ahead and do that too. I have no problem with that because I have answers for every single question he has on his list. And the answers that I have is nothing like what he claims the Christian response is going to be. So what we're going to do, I don't want to be accused at all of taking the gentleman out of context, putting words in his mouth, anything of that nature. So what I'm going to do is I'll play out, first of all, his introduction all the way to where he gets to the first question. Then we're going to come back and review what he said. We're going to dissect it because there are some things that you need to see. If you're a Christian out there like me, this video is going to be a learning process for you to show you the techniques and the strategies that are used by atheists to leer <laughs> to lure people away from the faith. I want to show you the styles, the techniques, the blend and blurs, the bait and switches, the trap doors, the minefields, the things that are set out there to trick you and to trap you. I want to try to warn you about these techniques that are used. When it gets to the questions, I'll play the question all the way through what he said. You'll hear the question, his emotional response, and what he claims is going to be the Christian's response. And then we're going to come back and I'm going to give you the real Christian response. So let's go ahead now and begin this video by playing his introduction. In this short video, I'm going to assume that you're an educated Christian. You have a college degree and you've been trained to think logically and rationally about the world we live in. 
For example, you might be an engineer or scientist, a doctor, pharmacist or nurse, a teacher, a manager or an administrator, a government employee, a business owner, an account rep, an executive, a lawyer, an accountant, a person working in the financial sector or human resources, an architect or designer, a software developer. In other words, you're a smart person. You know how the world works and you know how to think critically. If you're an educated Christian, I would like to talk with you today about an important and interesting question. Have you ever thought about using your college education to think about your faith? Your life and your career demand that you behave and act rationally. Let's apply your critical thinking skills as we discuss 10 simple questions about your religion. Here's an example of the kind of thing I'm talking about. As a Christian, you believe in the power of prayer. According to a recent poll, Three out of four doctors believe that God is performing medical miracles on earth right now. Most Christians believe that God is curing cancers, healing diseases, reversing the effects of poison, and so on. Okay, with the introduction, you will notice, first of all, he's pumping up your pride, telling you how intelligent you are. Now, what's the purpose of telling you how intelligent you are? The purpose is to pump up your pride to make you feel good about yourself. And then he names all these different fields of work, which basically covers just about anything, to make anybody in all these fields think, okay, you're really intelligent, but what's the real bottom line? He wants to convince you that you're too intelligent to be a Christian. And he wants you to use your brain to talk yourself out of believing the Bible. But here's the trick, you gotta remember, this is an atheist that's trying to pull you away from the Bible. He's counting on the fact that you don't know the book. If you know the book, you can nail these questions, but you have to have the right one. The King James Bible will nail these questions. The new Bibles will set you up, and I've been trying to warn people about these new versions for nearly 20 years now. And you're going to see now, in a little bit, how this atheist used the new versions to attack God. Can't do it with the King James. You can do it with the new versions. So we're going to start off his introduction. He's pumping up your pride. My King James Bible says, pride before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. He's pumping you up so that he can knock you down. Don't fall for it. He also mentions, at the very beginning of, this, of the, the video, the title of the video is supposed to be 10 questions every intelligent Christian should answer. Yet at the very beginning of the video, what do you have? You have a crucifix. He puts a crucifix on the screen. Now, by putting a crucifix on the screen, that shows me that he doesn't understand the difference between Orthodox Bible Christianity and the Roman Catholic Church. They are not the same thing. We use different Bibles. We use different Bible manuscripts. There's a whole bunch that's far different from Roman Catholicism and Orthodox Bible Christianity. If you want more information about that, on my YouTube page, youtube.com slash Jason Zelda, there's two documentaries there called Things That Are Hidden From Roman Catholics or Things Hidden From Roman Catholics. You can listen to those. There are many Roman Catholics who have listened to those two presentations and had their minds really opened up and their eyes opened up because what he does is he simply shows the Roman Catholic from their own Bible that what they're being taught is not even in their own Bible. And many Roman Catholics don't even know that. So Roman Catholicism and Orthodox Bible Christianity is not the same thing. But obviously this atheist doesn't know, so he puts a crucifix at the beginning of the video. Underneath the crucifix, he has what's supposed to be a Bible. But when I tried to find those verses that are listed there, it's from the book of Psalms, but it is not from the King James Version. So he doesn't know the difference between a real Bible and a fake Bible. The fake Bibles have verses missing, like Matthew 17, 21, Matthew 18, 11, Mark 9, 44, Mark 9, 46. Fake Bibles take the Trinity out of 1 John 5, 7, and a whole list of other things. They take Lucifer's name out of Isaiah 14. You'll be surprised how the new Bible versions change what the Bible is about to say. 
So here he is starting off his video with a crucifix and a fake Bible version. He also says there's a pole. Well, let me address that. Doctors, nurses, and those that are in that medical field, they all are fully aware that they are limited in what they can do. They can bandage you, they can stitch you up, they can take out parts, they can put in parts. There's things that they can do, but they know that there is a line that they can't cross. When they've done all that they can do, they have to take their hands off and let God take over from there. Because doctors, nurses, and those in the medical field are fully aware that they do not have the power to heal anybody. They can patch you up, but they can't heal you. If nurses and doctors and all could heal you, all the hospitals would be empty. So the poll is correct. Doctors, many of them do believe that God performs miracles because they know they did the best that they could do. And then something else had to take over to heal that body. So that's correct. What we're going to do is jump on to question number one. This one here I classify as the atheist atomic bomb. They believe that this question is the one question that if they catch a Christian at the right time, they'll destroy that Christian's faith. We're going to take a look to the question, his emotional response, and what he claims is going to be the Christian's response. And then we're going to come back and I'm going to give you the Christian's response. So here's question one. Why won't God heal amputees? It's a simple question, isn't it? We all know that amputated legs do not spontaneously regenerate in response to prayer. Amputees get no miracles from God. If you're an intelligent person, you have to admit that this is an interesting question. On the one hand, you believe that God answers prayers and performs miracles. On the other hand, you know that God completely ignores amputees when they pray for miracles. How do you deal with this discrepancy? As an intelligent person, you have to deal with it because it makes no sense. In order to handle it, notice that you have to create some kind of rationalization. You have to invent an excuse on God's behalf to explain this strange fact of life. You might say, well, God must have some kind of special plan for amputees. So you invent your excuse, whatever it is, and then you stop thinking about it because it's uncomfortable. Okay. Here's the answer to the question right from the very start. Yes, we Christians do believe in prayer, but everything that we get from our faith comes from the Bible. King James Bible. Now, if it's not in the Bible, we don't accept it as part of our faith. So if you're going to question us with a question like that, you have to first show me from my King James Bible where exactly did God ever say that he would give you body parts back just because you believed in prayer? You show me it in here, then we'll start believing you. But you know, and I know, it ain't in there. And what you're counting on is to run into a Christian that doesn't know the Bible. Because if the Christian know it's not in there in the first place, they're not going to fall for your trick. God never said he would give you your body parts back. So why are you holding him to that? In order to push your point, you had to use emotion. You said literally, amputees get no miracles from God. Really? If you're watching this video and you're an amputee, like me, I'm an amputee. You want a miracle? I'll give you a miracle. If you're an atheist and you're watching this video, my God still answers prayer. Because I pray that you would watch this video. And I'm an amputee. I think it's a miracle for an atheist to sit back and watch a Christian video knowing that this Christian might have something in that video something possibly from the Word of God that the atheist didn't know that might turn that atheist into a believer if you're watching this video and you're an atheist 
I don't hate you. You're not my enemy. And I hope you wouldn't see me as yours. Okay? I just want to inform you about some things that you might not know. If you're watching this and you're an amputee and you've had prayers answered, you've had miracles happen in your life, I want you to leave a comment down below this video telling them what happened. Tell the atheists how God has touched you, how he saved you, how whatever it is, whatever the miracle was that God did for you, please leave a comment down below so that those who are atheists who think the way that this gentleman thinks that God doesn't give miracles to amputees, I want them to see that God loves the amputee as much as anybody else. You even went as far as to say God completely ignores the amputee when they pray for a miracle. That my friend is low. Real low. Very, very low. So the pure answer to your question is simple. If God never said he was going to do it in the book, why are you trying to hold him to it? You're trying to trick Christians, and it's wrong. Question number two. I'm going to play his question, his emotional comment, and what he claims is going to be the Christian response, and then we're going to come back, and I'm going to give you the real Christian response. Here's another example. As a Christian, you believe that God cares about you and answers your prayers. So the second question is, why are there so many starving people in our world? Look out at our world and notice that millions of children are dying of starvation. It really is horrific. Why would God be worried about you getting a raise while at the same time ignoring the prayers of these desperate, innocent little children? It doesn't make sense, does it? Why would a loving God do this? To explain it, you have to come up with some kind of very strange excuse for God. Like, God wants these children to suffer and die for some divine, mysterious reason. Then you push it out of your mind because it absolutely does not fit with your view of a loving, caring God. Okay, once again, this question is arrived at from the atheist's lack of the knowledge of history. The lack of the knowledge of history. Let me ask the atheist first of all, if you believe this question is legit, could you please tell me what exactly did God do to starve these people? I mean, you're laying down a very heavy charge against him. The murder of young children by starvation, which is a very rough way to go out. So could you please explain to me exactly what did God do to starve these people? Don't give me he didn't do anything to help them. I'm going to show you where he did. But I want to know what exactly he did to starve them. Did he steal their food? Did he send angels down to steal their food? Did he sterilize the ground so they can't grow food? You've laid a serious charge at God's account with no proof and no evidence. And you say, why didn't he do something? Asking a question in the negative. I'm going to deal with your question by giving you a dose of history. By the sound of your voice, you sound like a young man. Maybe early 20s, maybe mid 20s. Might even be in your teenage years. I don't know. You sound like a young guy. So let me give you a little history because I'm not a young guy. Back in the 80s, when I was barely a teenager, there was only three TV networks in America. The main ones. ABC, NBC, CBS. All three of these networks, to this day, are very biased in their reporting. And back in the 80s, when I was growing up, those three stations were the only ones you had to choose from. So if they didn't tell you what was going on in the world, you didn't know. Well, the BBC over in England decided they were going to do a report on the hungry people in Africa. After the BBC did theirs, then finally the American press jumped in and began to show the American people what was going on over there. Once we found out what was happening, and we saw these, these kids, it was, it was so pathetic. They, these kids that were so thin, starving to death. The grown-ups looked like walking skeletons. 
It was scary to see that what in the world is going on here. The heart of the American people was broken. We couldn't believe this kind of thing was happening. I mean, we in America throw away enough food to feed a nation. So we were not going to sit back and allow these people to starve to death. Charities began to raise money. Christian and non-Christian charities began to raise money. People from all over started raising money to try to help these people out. Michael Jackson and Lionel Richie got together and wrote a song called We Are The World. And that song became a global hit. The song in and of itself brought in, according to this report here, over $60 million for the purpose of feeding these people. We stepped up, and so did other countries around the world to try to feed these people. So why then did they still starve to death? I'll tell you why. Many of these African countries are run by dictators and warlords. You give them a lump sum of money, and they'll take that money and put it in their pocket. Ethiopia was at war. So according to a report that I saw, I'll try to put it on the screen there for you, money was being given to their military to buy weapons. We didn't raise money for their military to buy weapons. We raised money for their government to feed their people. But the government could care less about their population. His mind was on the war. He wanted to fight and win this war. We send money, the money never seemed to go where we wanted it to go. So we started sending food, and lots of it. We sent shiploads of food over there. So why then did the people still starve to death? Look at your screen. You see here, report, news report. Food left to rot on the docks. That's right. We sent shiploads of food over there. Look at this map here as you see how far America is from Ethiopia. It's a long journey. They had plenty of time to build warehouses, storehouses, whatever was needed to contain this food. But they never did. He didn't take trucks off the battlefield. He didn't want to take trucks off the battlefield, I should say, in order to feed his population. So once the ships got there, they were told to unload the food on the docks. And they did. And that's where the food sat. On the docks. Day after day after day after day. Under the hot African sun. Until it rotted and spoiled. Now, who was responsible for this? You blamed God. You said God didn't hear the prayers. How come God didn't hear the prayers of these kids when they cried out for food? I would say if tons of food showed up, God answered the prayer for the food. But there was an obstacle in the way between the food and the people. And it was the leader of Ethiopia at that time. The dictator that ran the whole thing. Look at your screen. Here's a picture of the man. Now what do we know about this man? Well, take a look. It says here he's a Marxist-Leninist. What does that mean? What's the uh, religious philosophy of Marxist-Leninism? Well, let's take a look. The religious philosophy of Marxist-Leninism, it says right here, is atheism. So the man who starved his population to death was an atheist. He wasn't a Christian. So let me get this right then. An atheist leader starves his people to death. And you blame God for not doing anything about it? How exactly does that work? God heard their prayer and food was sent. 
But the atheist stood in the way and wouldn't let them get it. So how is that God's fault? When you look at this map here, this is the earliest map I could find, 2015, the hunger map. It shows you where the nations are that are still experiencing hunger and starvation. The ones in the green, not much starvation at all. And you'll notice most of these places are capitalistic countries. And then you look at some of the others that are really going through some really rough times. Before blaming God for these people starving, you need to take a good look at their government and see who's running it. To my knowledge, there's not a single government on the face of the earth that's run from top to bottom by Christians. I said Christians, I didn't say Catholics. I don't know of a single government that's run top to bottom by born-again, King James Bible-believing Christians. Or King James Bible-equivalent Christians. So you can't blame us, and you can't blame our God. But you'll find that many of these places out there are run by dictators who are atheistic, communist, Leninist, socialist, you name the ist, and usually there's atheism connected to it. Now you want to hitch your wagon to that? That's your choice. But I felt you at least had a right to know what history tells us. You want to follow the trail of blood? You want to follow the trail of death? You want to follow the trail of genocide? Look at these political groups whose roots are in atheism, like communism. And then ask yourself, do you really want to be a party to that? That mindset, that concept. Before blaming God for starving, hungry people, take a look at their governments and point the finger at the right place. God didn't do it. These evil, wicked leaders did. Question number three. Third question. Why does God demand the death of so many innocent people in the Bible? Look up these verses. Exodus 35, 2. God demands that we kill everyone who works on the Sabbath day. Deuteronomy chapter 21. God demands that we kill disobedient teenagers. Leviticus 20. God demands the death of homosexuals. Deuteronomy chapter 22. God demands that we kill girls who are not virgins when they marry and so on. There are lots of verses like these. It doesn't make any sense, does it? Why would a loving God want us to murder our fellow human beings over such trivial matters? Just because you work on the wrong day of the week, you must die? That makes no sense, does it? In fact, if you think about it, you realize that it's insane. So you create some kind of rationalization to explain these verses. You ask, why is there so much death in the Bible? And you quote, Books like Leviticus, Deuteronomy. This comes from a lack of understanding of the atheist of the Old Testament, of the Bible. The books of Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy are books of the Jewish law. These laws were not for everybody. It was for the Jews. The Jewish people were set aside by God to be his people, and they at Mount Sinai agreed to be his people. So he laid down his law that these are going to be the laws. If you didn't like the laws, don't be Jewish, and you don't have to follow them. Because he never ordained non-Jews to build temples to him. He never ordained non-Jews to burn sacrifices to him. He never ordained non-Jews to do these things or to follow these rules. These rules were for the Jewish people. Now you ask, why is there so much death? Have you ever heard the term a deterrent? A deterrent. The penalty is so high that somebody would think twice before committing the crime. They don't want to do the time. They don't commit the crime. If they knew that the penalty for doing this is death, they're going to think two, three, four, five times before committing the crime. You talked about people being stoned to death and so forth. Guys, look. How many stories do we have in the Bible where teenagers were taken to the gates of the city and stoned to death? 
Tell me. How many's in here? How many stories are in the Bible of rebellious teens who got away with what they were doing? Ruined countries, ruined people's lives. These ones that were supposed to have been taken to the gate and executed, they weren't. The Jewish people were not following the laws that God set down. They weren't obeying those laws. Absalom, son of David, should have been put to death according to the law for what he did to his dad. But he wasn't. The priests who had the sons that were sleeping with the women that were coming to offer sacrifices in the temple, according to the scripture, they were to be taken to the gates of the city and stoned to death, but they weren't. So God laid down the law, but these laws were given to the Jewish people, not to everybody. And in the book of Acts, chapter 15, when the Gentiles had the Holy Spirit poured out upon them, in verse number 5, they were asking whether or not they need to be circumcised or command them to keep the law of Moses. And they decided in verse 10, it says, Now therefore, why tempt ye God and put a yoke on the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? Those laws were not meant for the Gentiles. That's why they had to ask whether or not to put the Gentiles under laws like circumcision and the laws of Moses. So the laws that you complain about were laws that were set aside exclusively for the Jewish people. It was not for everybody and it's put together as a deterrent and the people ignored the law anyway. So what God ended up doing was this. You heard the term a last will and testament. Of course you have. When does the will go into effect? The will goes into effect when the person who wrote the will dies. Who wrote the Old Testament Ten Commandments? God did. According to the New Testament, it was Christ that went with the children of Israel through the wilderness. It was Jesus that was doing all these miracles for them. It was him that was doing all these things. Therefore, it was him that with his own finger wrote those Ten Commandments on those stones. So before giving us a New Testament, the one who wrote the Old Testament had to die. The human race was not able to fulfill the Old Testament because it was designed in such a way that if you break one law, you're guilty of breaking all of them. The only one in the universe that could obey those laws was the one that wrote them in the first place. And that's God. So God, who couldn't die, took on a human body that could die so that he can put to death the old law. The ordinances that were against us. He nailed it to his cross so that they're not against us anymore. And then he gave us a new testament. Under the new testament, we're not under the bunch of thou shall not, thou shall not, thou shall not, thou shall not anymore. We're under grace now. We believe that when Jesus died on that cross and he said, It is finished, it's finished. He didn't say to be continued. He didn't say, okay, I've done my parts. Now it's time for you to do your part. No. He said, it's finished. He finished the old law. And we're not under that anymore. And that means everybody now. The Jewish people don't have to be under it. The non-Jewish people don't have to be under it. All of us can now come together in Christ. And have our sins forgiven by believing on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. That when he died on that cross, he paid for all of our sins. We can't earn it. We can't pay for it. We're not going to get to heaven on judgment day. Stand before God and say, you need to let me in because I did this and I did that. And I'm so good and, and I'm a good person. That's not going to cut it. Anybody that makes it to heaven is going to make it there by one way. They believed on Jesus Christ. That he died on that cross for their sins. Period. Not because of anything we've done. Not because of anything we've done. It's because of what he did for us. So the question is simple. Why was there so much death? Because these laws were set aside for the Jewish people. They were to be a peculiar people, a unique people, a theocratic people, but they could not abide by the law. 
So God was not going to lie and change his law. He just decided to come and fulfill the law. And then once the law is fulfilled, he scraps it and gives us a brand new testament where we're not under those ordinances anymore. That's the story of the Bible. And that's the answer to your question. Now on to the next question. Question four. Why does the Bible contain so much anti-scientific nonsense? You have a college degree, so you know what I'm talking about. You know how science works. You happily use the products of science every day. Your car, your cell phone, your microwave oven, your TV, your computer. These are all products of the scientific process. You know that science is incredibly important to our economy and to our lives. But there's a problem. As an educated person, you know that the Bible contains all sorts of information that's total nonsense from a scientific perspective. God did not create the world in six days, 6,000 years ago, like the Bible says. There was never a worldwide flood that covered Mount Everest, like the Bible says. Jonah did not live inside a fish's stomach for three days, like the Bible says. God did not create Adam from a handful of dust, like the Bible says. These stories are all nonsense. Why would an all-knowing God write nonsense? It makes no sense, does it? So you create some type of very strange excuse to try to explain why the Bible contains total nonsense. Now this is one I've been looking forward to. In your presentation here, you covered so much stuff that it's going to take me a little bit to cover everything but everything will be covered and we're going to have some fun because I love science I really really love science so this is where I am in the middle of all this you said quote the Bible contains all sorts of information that is total nonsense from a scientific perspective is that right you really believe that my King James Bible contains total nonsense when it comes to science. I want to ask you, as a friend, remember, I'm not attacking you, I'm not raising my voice at you, I'm not doing anything, I'm just simply asking you a question. You really genuinely believe that this Bible has no science in it. Why do you believe this Bible has no science in it? How much science would I have to show you to prove to you that this King James Bible has legitimate science in it? Not only does it have legitimate science in it, it talked about things of science long before modern day science even figured it out. It was already in here. And I'm going to show you the proof. How much science would I have to show you to convince you? Let's go ahead and get started. This here is a chart. I'm going to put it up on your screen. Scientific proof of the Bible. Remember, when you're looking these verses up, do not use the so-called modern versions of the Bible. They are fake, they are frauds, and they change what the Bible is supposed to say. Use the King James. It's different. It's translated from completely different manuscripts than these new Bibles. If you want to learn more about this, this King James Bible is not hard to understand. It's not hard to read. On my YouTube page, youtube.com slash Jason Zelda, I have a video up there called Answering the Critics of the King James Bible. I explain to you what the these and thous and yees mean. They're in here for a reason. They have a special meaning. You can't just take those out and replace it with the word you, as the new Bible versions do, or you're going to end up destroying verses of the Bible. It's very important that you watch that video so that you'll understand the difference between this King James Bible and all those other ones out there that have changed what the Bible is supposed to say. When you go through these verses, go through them with the authorized King James Version, not the one called the New King James. That's a fake. You want to stick with the authorized King James Version. I'm going to cover some things real quick. I'm going to give you what the science is, where in the Bible it's found. 
the fact that air has weight is mentioned in the Bible in the book of Job chapter 28 verse 25 you can read verses leading up to it to read it in its context and you'll see that it points out the air has weight scientists discovered that in the 16th century scientists found that out much later down the road the earth is round Isaiah 40:22. he sit up on the circle of the earth the earth is round according to the Bible oceans have natural paths in them Psalms 8 8 they discovered that in 1854 according to this chart but it's been in the Bible since the days of the books of Psalms thousands of years ago it's been here in the Bible there's a place void of stars in the north the book of Job 26 7 you can go online and you will see that scientists have discovered that it's very strange that there is a section in outer space that is void of stars the Bible already told you that was up there the earth is held in place by invisible forces Job 26 7 the earth sits on nothing the Bible tells you that how do the ancients know that the earth is just floating around out there it's in the Bible my King James early diagnosis of leprosy Leviticus 13 you are to quarantine people as disease control Leviticus 13 it's all in the Bible blood is necessary for life Leviticus 17 11 the earth was in nebular form initially Genesis 1 2 when the earth was originally made by God he made it without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep light is a particle and has mass Job 38 19 is that science or not the ocean contains fresh water springs Job 38 16 these are things verifiable by science guys you said there's no science in my Bible an infinite number of stars exist Genesis 15 5 no matter how far we look out there with our telescopes even the telescopes we have in outer space we cannot seem to get beyond the stars everywhere we go there's stars 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 everywhere we go the Bible already told you that let's see here light can be split up into component colors Job 38 24 matter is made up of invisible particles Hebrews 11 3 through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the Word of God so the things which were seen were not made of things which do appear that's in my Bible the things that we see are made up of things that we can't see atoms it's always in my Bible all they had to do was read it they would have found out the water cycle Ecclesiastes 1 7 not only is the water cycle in Ecclesiastes chapter 1 you have four cycles in Ecclesiastes chapter 1 it says a generation comes a generation goes but the earth remains so you got the life cycle the Sun rises and the Sun sets and hastens back you have the solar cycle it says the winds blow from the south to the north and then back to the south in its circuits you got the wind cycle and then it says the rivers run to the sea yet the sea is not full once the waters begin so it returns the water cycle life cycle solar cycle wind cycle water cycle in my King James Bible all verifiable by science and they told you there's no science in my Bible they lied to you why did they lie to you because they didn't want you to know the secrets of this book that's why 
There's more. There's a lot more. I'm going to have some fun because I love science, so give me just a minute, guys. You mentioned about Noah and the flood. I'm loving this. I'm absolutely loving this. You kept saying... As the Bible said, you said God didn't make Adam from a handful of dust, as the Bible said. Could you please show me in my King James Bible where it says God made Adam from a handful of dust? You said as the Bible said. But it's not in here. It didn't say how much dust he used. You said Mount Everest, as the Bible said. Again, can you show me in my King James Bible, Mount Everest? Because you said, as the Bible said. See, you're putting stuff in the Bible that's not there. The Bible said the waters of the flood in the days of Noah got above the highest mountain. So how do we know that Mount Everest was the highest mountain four or five thousand years ago when the flood happened? We don't know. But I do have an answer for you, because you said it didn't happen. I'm going to show you the evidence that it did. Because there's science that's hidden from you that I would hope you'd look into. And I think I'm going to make this the last question, because I'm looking at my clock here. I'm at 44 or so minutes right about now. I want to make this first video about an hour. And if you guys want some more answers to questions, just let me know and I'll do it. But right now, I want to deal with this issue here of Noah and the flood. Many people, when they think of Noah and the flood, they think of it rained 40 days and 40 nights. But they don't take into account that the King James Bible has a second source for where the water came from. The King James Bible says the fountains of the great deep were broken up. So the Bible is trying to tell us that down deep within the earth is a massive amount of water. So much water that when that water was brought up to the surface in the days of Noah, there was so much water that it covered the highest mountain. Now the problem that a lot of people have today is that this is the image that they often present of what the earth looks like on the inside. When I was going to school, that's the image that they presented. And they presented it as if it was absolute, unquestionable fact. Then a few years ago, there was a discovery made. So which one is right? The science books, which says there's no water, according to these pictures, you don't see any water in these pictures. Or is my King James Bible right that down deep within the earth is a large amount of water, so much water that if it came to the surface, it would more than cover the highest mountain? I'm going to quote for you, or actually what I'm going to do is even better than that, because I want you to do some research as well. Underneath this video, you're going to see a bunch of links. I'm going to name them off for you. I'm not talking lunatic fringe websites. I went to legitimate, straightforward websites that many of you would consider as authorities. I'm talking about the UK Daily Mail from December 6, 2016, the Huffington Post, PBS, Earth.com, LiveScience.com, Washington Post, USA Today, and Time Magazine. All of these sources verify that the video that I'm about to show you is correct. And you can read the proof from all of these other sources. Take a look at this video. New evidence suggests Earth's oceans might themselves be just a drop in the ocean. Scientists now theorize there's more water hiding beneath the planet's crust. A lot more. 
A team of U.S. geophysicists has released a paper detailing a suspected rock layer in the Earth's mantle that could hold roughly three times the water present in all of the planet's surface oceans. BBC reports scientists credit a mineral called ringwoodite, which has a sponge-like crystalline structure that's perfect for trapping and holding hydrogen and oxygen atoms. So it's not H2O down there, but rather hydroxide, one atom each of hydrogen and oxygen. In March, scientists at the University of Alberta discovered a natural diamond carried up from Earth's mantle by way of a volcano. It contained the first known sample of ringwoodite and led scientists to theorize there was a lot more where it came from. More recently, scientists used seismometers to track the progress of shock waves triggered by earthquakes. The way the waves moved suggested there were vast deposits of ringwoodite slowing them down. As new scientists put it, it takes them longer to get through soggy rock than dry rock. There was then a hypothesis that maybe the deep earth has a lot of water. We found it. This is, this is the, the direct evidence. The confirmation supports other theories. For example, that Earth's original water came from within and not from space aboard comets. One of the study's co-authors told The Guardian, I think we are finally seeing evidence for a whole Earth water cycle, which may help explain the vast amount of liquid water on the surface of our habitable planet. But this water reserve is out of reach, at 440 miles down in the mantle. The deepest humans have ever drilled into Earth is 7.6 miles, at the Kola Superdeep Borehole in northern Russia. In any case, the water is probably better off down there. We'd have trouble with sea levels four times higher than they are now. Scientists now want to determine whether the layer of ringwoodite extends all the way around the globe. In the meantime, their findings have been published in the journal Science. For Newsy, I'm Bryce Sander. So scientists have discovered a massive ocean of water under the surface of the earth. Deep. Just like my King James Bible said. At least three times or more water is down there than there is up here. So let's take a look at the water up here. When we look at a map of the Earth, we see all this water. But I want you to take note that you're seeing the top of it. This water goes down quite a ways. The deepest part of the ocean is over six miles deep. That's pretty far down. The highest mountain is over five miles. Over five miles tall. They say there's more water down underneath the earth than there is up here. So if the water up here can get as low as six miles, and there's at least three or more times that amount down deep, if that water comes to the surface, as the Bible said it did, it would be more than enough to cover the mountains. Just like the Bible said. I decided to download Google Earth to see if I could find any signs of the flood, a crack, or many cracks in the Earth. And you'll find it very interesting if you download Google Earth, the number of cracks that span pretty much the entire duration of the planet, like this one here that I'm tracing. This crack goes all the way down, basically from uh, Iceland all the way down to the bottom of the Earth and curves around and comes back up the other side of the planet, sort of back up a little bit, and you see here? So you can see it's still this crack going all the way around the planet, all the way around. Very interesting uh, geology underneath the Earth there, because it's still following the crack, and you see it goes right up, strangely into that area there where the Bible talks about, in the African Egypt Red Sea area, where this particular one that I was looking at goes to. Could that be where the fountains of the Great Deep broke up? Remember, they said there's so much water down there. There's way more water down there than up here. So it just cracked through all that ground all the way around the entire planet. Flooding the entire planet. As we consider this issue where this atheist gentleman claims there's no science in my Bible, I want you to think of something. My King James Bible says, Go to the ant, thou sluggard. Consider her ways and be wise. Well, I find something very interesting when you do go to the ant. 
Many of us, when we think of ants, we think of the ant hills. And we don't realize that the larger the ant hill, the larger the city that they built underground. Someone decided they would take liquid metal and pour it down an ant hill, let it cool, and then dig it out because he knew that the metal would take on the shape of whatever the ants built underground. He would then dig it out and then wash it off and see what shape comes out. Now those of you who've never seen this before, prepare to be blown away. Absolutely blown away by what you're going to see. As we obey what the King James Bible says and consider the ant. There are people now who are making big money doing this. Different ants make different things underground. Maybe it could be you who could make money off doing this. I don't know. But some of you have never seen this before. And since the atheist says there's no science in my Bible, let me just give you guys a little taste of some very interesting stuff that is in my King James Bible. I will give you this, considering the ant. He starts with a very well insulated garbage can in which he melts you know aluminum. We're going to try to do the full crucible. Oh. The cast will sacrifice the lives of the ants, but it will also provide useful research on their mysterious underground colonies. I don't do it lightly, actually. No, no. When the temperature gets to be about 1200 degrees Fahrenheit, <laughs> It looks pretty good. Huh? The aluminum melts and it's ready to pour. We have it. Ready? Don't try this on your own. Wow. And so that's just going deep into the earth. Yeah. Several is, feet down. It's, it's really very good so far. After only a few minutes, the metal hardens and it's time to dig it out. I think this is going to be good. Wow. Yep, there it is. With a lot of hard digging, the little chambers and tunnels of the colony are unearthed. You can see that where there's a lot of traffic that is near the surface, yeah. the, the shaft is actually a, a ribbon, a wide tunnel, like a superhighway. Oh, yeah. The more traffic it has, the wider it is. And down below are the storage rooms. They store seeds, in fact, no, the, this... There, there are some seeds. Mm -hmm. After about seven hours, it's finally time to lift out the casting. Wow. Isn't that something? Like a chandelier. Okay. In fact, today's cast is a winner. Now, this is the best metal cast I've ever made. Certainly the biggest by far. Who knew that tiny ants could be such natural designers or that the study of ants would reveal such beauty? There's actually more art and science than most people suspect. The casts also reveal just how very different ant species are from one another. Can I hold it? Yeah, sure. You could use this in a barroom fight. Oh, wow. That's it's, so... it's, our, it's our biggest ant. You can ball. see some of Walter Chingle's castings in museums around the country. Or better yet, find real ant colonies all around you. Just look down at your feet. Now that's pretty interesting, isn't it? I bet many of you never knew that underneath your feet these ants had built such amazing structures. And just remember, the King James Bible told you, consider the ant. And now you have an idea as to why. This book is filled with wisdom for you. Ecclesiastes, Proverbs, are two books in the King James Bible that is filled with wisdom that will help you in your life. So we're going to continue on with this video dealing with the Bible and science. I hope you guys are enjoying it. This gentleman was told there's no science in my Bible. We've been dealing with this issue of science in my King James Bible. We've coined out a lot of stuff of science in the King James Bible. The Bible speaks of DNA. Of course, it's not going to use the word DNA because DNA is a modern term. The Bible identifies DNA by several terms. Seed, generations is another word, and a book. 
And David talks about the book that contains all his members. We'll put it on the screen for you. In thy book, all my members are written. Scientists have learned that DNA is a very, very complicated book. It has letters. It has punctuation. It is a digital code that could not be created by random chance. It is way too complicated and people who deal with DNA knows that now. I want to show you a couple of videos to help you understand what I'm talking about. DNA is a book. I'm going to show you the proof. These are short videos. Just take them in and so you can understand better of what I'm talking about. To prove that when this King James Bible is talking science, it's telling you the truth. Scientists today have learned that DNA is a book. They've learned how to read the book. They've learned how to rewrite the book as they're creating their own synthetic DNA now, which shows, by the way, that you need intelligence to create DNA. And they've also learned how to edit the book of DNA. Now they can make genetically modified food, genetically modified plants, genetically modified animals, and coming soon, genetically modified human beings. Check out the video. Every human being starts out the same way. Two cells, one from each parent, found each other and became one. And that one cell reproduced itself, dividing and dividing and dividing, until there were 10 trillion of them. Do you realize there's more cells in one person's body than there are stars in the Milky Way? But those 10 trillion cells aren't just sitting there in a big pile. That would make for a pretty boring human being. So what is it that says a nose is a nose and toes is toes? What is it that says, this is bone, and this is brain, and this is heart, and this is that little thing in the back of your throat you can never remember the name of? Everything that you are or ever will be made of starts as a tiny book of instructions found at each and every cell. Every time your body wants to make something, it goes back to the instruction book, looks it up, and puts it together. So how does one cell hold all that information? Let's get small. I mean really small. Smaller than the tip of a sewing needle. Then we can take a journey inside a single cell to find out what makes up the book of you, your genome. The first thing we see is that the whole genome, all your DNA, is contained inside its own tiny compartment called the nucleus. If we stretched out all the DNA in this one cell into a single thread, it would be over three feet long. But we have to make it fit in a tiny compartment that's a million times smaller. We could just bunch it up like Christmas lights, but that could get messy. We need some organization. First, the long thread of DNA wraps around proteins clustered into little beads called nucleosomes, which end up looking like a long beaded necklace. Then that necklace is wrapped up in its own spiral like an old telephone cord, and those spirals get layered on top of one another until we have a neat little shape that fits inside the nucleus. Voila! Three feet of DNA squeezed into a tiny compartment. If only we could hire DNA to pack our suitcases. Each tiny mass of DNA is called a chromosome. The book of you would have 46 chapters. One for each chromosome. 23 chapters of your book came from your mom, and 23 chapters came from your dad. Two of those chapters, called X and Y, determine if you're male, XY, or female, XX. Put them together, and we get two almost identical, but slightly different sets of 23 chapters. The tiny variations are what makes each person different. It's estimated that all the chapters together hold about 20,000 individual instructions called genes. Written out, all those 20,000 instructions are 30 million letters long. If someone were writing one letter per second, it would take them almost an entire year to write it once. But it turns out that our genome book is much, much longer than just those 30 million letters. Almost a hundred times longer. What are all those extra pages for? Well, each set of instructions has a few pages of nonsense inserted that have to be taken out before we end up with something useful. The parts we throw out we call introns. The instructions we keep we call exons. We can also have hundreds of pages in between each gene. Some of these excess pages were inserted by nasty little infections in our ancestors, but some of them are actually helpful. They protect the ends of each chapter from being damaged, or some help our cells find a particular thing they're looking for, or give the cell a signal to stop making something. 
All in all, for every page of instructions, there's almost 100 pages of filler. In the end, each of our book's 46 chapters is between 48 and 250 million letters long. That's 3.2 billion letters total. To type all that copy, you'd be at it for over 100 years, and the book would be over 600,000 pages long. Every type of cell carries the same book, but each has a set of bookmarks that tell it exactly which pages it needs to look up. So a bone cell reads only the set of instructions it needs to become bone. Your brain cells? They read the set that tell them how to become brain. If some cells suddenly decide to start reading other instructions, they can actually change from one type to another. So every little cell in your body is holding on to an amazing book, full of the instructions for life. Your nose reads nose pages, your toes read toes pages. And that little thing in the back of your throat? It's got its own pages too. They're under uvula. Now, scientists have come up with this thing called CRISPR, C-R-I-S-P-R. -R. This CRISPR system is used to take DNA and rewrite it. It's a book. And they're learning how to rewrite the book. I find it interesting, though. God put together a book. And he also wrote the book of DNA. At the end of this book, he warns you, don't add to it and don't take away from it. There are scientists who are taking the other book that God wrote, the book of DNA, and they're adding to it, and they're taking away from it. And I'm really wondering what's going to end up happening in the long run. So I'm going to try to squeeze this last piece of science in, because this is very interesting. Quantum science. When I was growing up, I was told the atom was the smallest thing in the universe. And then somebody came along and said, but what's the atom made of? And everything changed. Science began to look below the level of the atom to try to find out what's there. And when they did, they discovered an entirely new dimension called the quantum dimension. In the quantum dimension, it doesn't operate like ours. And scientists are mystified by this. Einstein was mystified by this. You see, in the quantum dimension, when you get down to the super, super small, below the atomic level, to use a modern day expression, we're used to the light switch is on or the light switch is off. Computers operate that way. It's called binary. Either the switch is on, which is a one, or the switch is off, and that's a zero. In the quantum world, though, the switch can be on or the switch can be off or the switch can be both at the same time. I didn't say light switch in the middle. I said both at the same time. It's both on and off. If that makes your brain hurt, then you're understanding how the scientists feel that they're trying to understand how this works. They have seen how a molecule can be both here and on the other side of the universe at the exact same time. But it didn't have to travel from here to there. It's just here and there. It's the same molecule. So how is it both placed at the same time? But that's how things are in the quantum world. Ponder that. In the quantum world, something is, yet it isn't, but it is. It's both here, and it's there, and it's both. Now let's take a look at the King James Bible and see if we find some things in here that sounds very much like quantum talk, where something is one place and something is another place, yet they're in both places at the same time. We're going to go to the book of John, chapter 3, verse 13, the words of Jesus. Listen closely to what he says based upon what I was just talking about. No man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. Where was Jesus standing when he made that statement? He was standing on earth, but he's saying at the same time, he's in heaven. 
Maybe he's trying to convey to us something that goes way beyond what we even understand. Because he didn't do it once. He did this several times. Let's go to John chapter 14, verse 3. Jesus says, If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. So I want you to notice he's saying where I am present tense there ye may be future tense also. So this is another instance where Jesus is speaking of himself being two places at once. In John chapter 17 verse 24 we have a third instance of Jesus speaking of being two places at once. John chapter 17 verse 24 he says Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. Now wasn't the ones who the Father gave him already with him on earth? So obviously he wasn't talking about being with him here. He's talking about these disciples being with him in heaven where he's there in all his glory. So we have three instances here where it sounds very much like Jesus is using quantum style speech of speaking of being two places at once. But there's one in the book of Revelation that really got my attention about a future event. And I want to read this one to you as we close down this video. In the book of Revelation, chapter 17, verse 8, it describes a beast that's going to come to the earth in the future and wreak havoc on this earth. Listen to how this beast is described. It says, The beast that thou sawest was, and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit, and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder, whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, when they shall behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. Once again, the King James Bible speaking in quantum speak about a future coming beast that's going to come to this world and wreak havoc in the future. So, for the gentleman who said that the Bible has no science in it, We've covered a whole lot of science, and there's one link that I want to point you guys to at the bottom of the page. 101 things mentioned in the Bible dealing with science. I'm going to include that in the link below. It's an interesting study, guys. We dealt with the first four questions of a 10-question series. And I hope I've given you guys some information that will help out, help you understand, and help you probe deeper. There's so much in this King James Bible, and I find it so interesting that so many people, both inside and outside of Christianity, are fighting so hard to prevent Christians from reading the King James Bible. And there's so many nuggets that are in here that they don't want you to have. There's information in here that the new Bibles don't have in it. They took it out. This has it all in there. So what are they trying to hide from you? If you're an atheist and you've never picked up a King James Bible and read it, I challenge you as a friend. Again, I'm not yelling at you. I didn't yell at you not one time. We don't agree. That's okay. We don't have to agree. But I at least want you to take an opportunity to pick this up and start reading it. Like I say, if you have trouble understanding the these and thous, it isn't a lot of them in there. I mean, people make it sound like every other word is thee or thou. That's not the case. But if you need some help with it, just go ahead and watch my little video called uh, Answering the Critics of the King James Bible and it'll explain it to you. There's information in here you need to know. It tells you what's going to happen in the future. Very interesting stuff when you get in here. There are secrets in here people don't want you to know. So they're trying hard to flood the zone with fake Bible versions so that nobody will read this. I'm hoping you would read it. I'm hoping you would take the opportunity to try to find out what they don't want you to know. If you're an atheist and you watch this video, you heard the questions, you heard me give answers. I backed the stuff up with documentation, with proof, with the Bible with history, the things that I could bring up to try to help out. Now let me give you a quick message. We're all sinners. We've all blown it. 
Okay, Bible already gives us ten commandments. The ten commandments are given to the Jewish people, but we can look at those ten commandments and realize we've blown it. We've broken at least one. And the Bible said you break one, you're guilty of breaking all of them. Okay. But the Bible also says God would that none would perish, but that all would come to repentance. He doesn't want to have to judge us. He doesn't want to have to condemn us. While men are trying to aspire to become God, the God of this King James Bible took the time to become a man. And he walked with us and he talked with us and he laughed with us and he spent time with us and he tried to show us the way to live. He came to this earth as the one we know as Jesus Christ. If there ever was a good man, if you want to assume that he's just a good man and not God, then understand it. Okay, fine. If he's just a good man, then accept him as a good man and read what he had to say about himself. He cared enough to come down here from heaven. And you heard these quantum things he had to say about himself. There's more to him than what meets the eye. There's much more to him. Why was he able to walk on water? Why was he able to heal the sick? Why was he able to, ch to change water into wine? Why was he able to control the weather? Why was he able to predict the future? Is he a quantum being? Or is he the one that created the quantum world? And he gave us just a little glimpse of it. And what did we humans do to him? The good man who walked among us, who did nothing wrong to anybody. What did we do to him? We crucified him on a cross. And now they point their satellites to the heavens, looking out into the stars, trying to find what? Trying to find other planets. And you ask them, why are they trying to find other planets? They said, trying to find them in the Goldilocks zone. Well, why are you trying to find planets in the Goldilocks zone? Because they're hoping to find life out there. Why are they trying to find life out there? Because they're hoping to find alien contact. Why do you want to find alien contact? Because they believe in Darwin. That we're going to be evolved to the next level. You want to follow Darwin? I want you to look at something. Many of us are told that his book is called Origin of the Species. That's not the full title of the book. And it's a shame that so many people have never been told what the full title of the book is. So let me give it to you, and you can look this up and verify that I'm telling you the truth. This is the full title of his book. It's a big, long title. It's called On the Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection or the Preservation of Favored Races in the Struggle for Life. Look it up and you'll verify I'm telling you the truth. Or the Preservation of Favored Races. Really, Darwin? So he believed one race is better than another. Could it be that this whole philosophy was built on racism? This whole Darwinian evolution nonsense is built on racism? Just by the title of the book. And why did they hide the full title from you? We as Christians, we don't hide nothing. We put our God right in the very front. In the very first book, in the very first verse, in the beginning, God. Right there at the very beginning, we put our God right up front. But they hide from you Darwin's real intentions by hiding from you the full title of his book. Just look into these things, guys. Jesus offers you forgiveness of sins. We've all blown it. He's willing to forgive you if you're willing to come and ask him. You don't have to do anything above and beyond. He never asked you to. You just come to him and ask him to forgive you of your sins. And he'll take it from there. Just like the doctor who does all they can do and they take their hands off and they let God do what needs to be done. In your life, you may have done all you can do and you just can't seem to get your life together. Or you pretend like it's together, but down inside, you know that you're just as empty as the day is long. Jesus Christ is God, and he cares enough about you that he came down here to this earth, 
He lived among us and he tried to help us. And he offers us forgiveness of sins. We've all sinned. He offers it free. He didn't say you had to go to church every Sunday. He didn't say you had to join some religion. He didn't say you had to be good, whatever good is. He simply said, come unto me, all ye that are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. All those who come unto me, I will in no wise cast them out. You might say, well, you don't know what I've done. I don't have to know what you've done. Jesus knows what you've done, and he's willing to forgive you if you just come to him, pray, and ask him to forgive you of your sins. Would you be willing to do that? I'm hoping so. This is the end of answering the atheist video number one. If you guys are interested in any more videos on this topic, just leave me comments down below and I'll do some more videos like this when I have some free time, which I don't have a lot of right now. I got to head to bed because I got to wake up in a few hours, but I wanted to do this for you guys. Okay, so I look forward to seeing you guys on the next video. Until next we meet, may the grace of my God Jesus be with you. I'm Jason Zelda and I'm tapping out. Good night, everybody. Greetings, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Jason Zelda here today with video number two of the Answering the Atheist video series. I want to thank those of you who tuned in to video number one where we answered four of the ten questions. I didn't want to drag it out too long because there's a lot of information that you guys need to have and it's very easy to get caught up in a situation like this and end up making a super long video that nobody really has a lot of time to watch. So I wanted to stop it at four. On the last video, I want to thank those of you who took the time out to watch it. As of right now, nearly a thousand views of that video, so I'm thankful for that. We're going to move on now to video number two of the series, and in this one, I'm going to attempt to answer his last six. And I think it should be easier to answer these last six because the questions, as you'll notice, tend to get weaker as he gets closer to number ten. In many cases, the questions that they're asking has nothing to do with God. So uh, we're going to deal with those as we get to it. We're not going to waste any time. For those of you who are not familiar with the format as to how this atheist presents his questions, what he'll do is he'll present a question, he'll often give an emotional response, and then he will give what he says is the Christian's response. But if you have an atheist giving what is supposed to be the Christian's response, then you would expect that we Christians are going to be made to look as bad as possible. And that is the case as to how he presents his video. So what I wanted to do is I simply wanted to give a proper Christian response so that you would know what the real answers to these issues is rather than what they say we're going to say. You'll actually hear from a Christian what the answers are. And as I always do with the videos that I put together, it will be backed up with heavy documentation and things you can look up for yourselves and research for yourselves so you can know that I'm not making it up because the bottom line for me is I want people to believe the King James Bible. I want them to believe in the God of this Bible. I want them to understand the God of this Bible. And when you're listening to atheists or if you're listening to people who are involved in various different cult groups, you're going to find out a very wrong and skewed view of who God is. This King James Bible straightens it out so you can know who he really is. So we're going to jump right into this by answering his next question. What I'm going to do so that nobody claims that I'm taking him out of context, I will play his entire question, his entire emotional reaction, and what he claims is going to be the Christian's response. And then I'm going to come back and give you the real Christian response. We're going to be starting at question number five, which is where we left off. Question five. Why is God such a huge proponent of slavery in the Bible? And why do all intelligent people abhor slavery and make it completely illegal? You have to come up with some kind of weird rationalization to explain it. Okay, so he asks, why is God such a proponent of slavery? Do you know that you cannot read the King James Bible and walk away believing that God is a proponent of slavery? But you can with the new versions. The so-called new modern Bible versions that I've preached against for nearly 20 years now 
have gotten to the point where an atheist and others can pick him up, read it, and actually think that God is a heavenly slave master because that's how the new versions are written. Let me explain to you what they've done. In the King James Bible, it would use the word servant. Servant. The new Bible versions tend to scrap the word servant and use slave instead. Now here's the difference. The servant, if you have a job, you're a servant on that job. You're not a slave. You might feel like it sometimes, but you're not a slave on your job. You're a servant. Servants have rights. If you get sick, you can call in sick as a servant. You get tired of the job, you can quit and go somewhere else as a servant. Nobody's forcing you to go there. Nobody's forcing you to work there. The slave, on the other hand, does not have rights. The slave is forced against their will to do things. The slave has no say in the issue. The slave cannot quit when they want to quit. And the slave is forced under penalty of punishment to do what they do. When you take the word of God and you rewrite it as the new versions have done, and you remove servant a bunch of times and replaces it with slave, you completely change the complexion of the Bible by doing that. And it's wrong. And I've told people for years, the purpose of these new Bible versions has nothing to do with making the Bible easier to read and easier to understand. The purpose of these new Bible versions is to destroy Christianity from the inside because faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So what happens if you change the word of God? You change what people are hearing. And when you change what they hear, when you change what is written here, you change the faith from the inside. Because as Christians, all we learn about our faith comes from the Bible. So when somebody comes along and decides to change the Bible, the next generation that's raised on these new Bible versions are going to be raised following a different God. Because the God of the King James Bible and the God of these new versions are not the same God. It's not the same. I can give you plenty of proof. It's not the same God. You look at the New International Version. I can ask you, who was with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace? Anyone who knows the story knows it was Jesus in the fiery furnace with them. My answer? Prove that from the NIV, from the New International Version. Prove it was Jesus in the New International Version. You can't. Because the New International Version has changed that verse, where in my King James Bible, Nebuchadnezzar says the fourth man is like the Son of God. You trace the Son of God through the Bible, who are you going to run into? Jesus Christ. But the New International Version says the fourth man looks like a son of the gods. Is Jesus a son of the gods? No. It's a different God. So you got to be careful when you're dealing with this. So here we have the new versions here using this word slave all the time. I want to show you just how bad it is. I'm going to put it up on the screen for you so you can see it. This is what you find out when you look into these new Bible versions, how many times they use the word slave. The new King James uses the word slave 73 times. The new living translation used the word slave 266 times. 266 times. The New International Version uses the word slave 202 times. The English Standard Version uses the word slave 144 times. The Holman Christian Standard Version uses the word slave 344 times. I'm showing you right here on the screen. The New American Standard Version uses the word slave 204 times. We're just going through these new versions here so you can see. The New English Translation, 251 times they use the word slave. The Revised Standard Version, 158 times they use the word slave in that version. Now let's look at the real Bible, the King James Bible, and see how many times the word slave appears in the real Bible. As you see, the word slave only appears two times 
in the real Bible, the King James Bible, two times. So let's take a look at the two verses where the word slave is used and see if God is a proponent or an opponent of slavery. Okay, here's the verse here, Jeremiah chapter 2. This is what it says, verse 14. Is Israel a servant? Is he a home-born slave? Why is he spoiled? The young lions roared upon him and yelled, and they made his land waste. His cities are burned without inhabitant. Does that sound like God is a proponent of slavery? Doesn't sound like God's a proponent of slavery to me in this verse. Let's check the other verse. Maybe there's something there. Okay, the only other verse in the King James Bible that uses the word slave is Revelation chapter 18. In order to read it in its context, we're going to start at verse 9 and read to verse 14. It says, The kings of the earth who have committed fornication and lived deliciously with her shall bewail her and lament for her. And when they shall see the smoke of her burning, standing afar off for the fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, the great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour is thy judgment come. And the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her, for no one buyeth their merchandise any more. The merchandise of gold and silver and precious stones and of pearls and fine linen and purple and silk and scarlet and all thylene wood and all manner vessels of ivory and all manner vessels of precious wood and of brass and iron and marble and cinnamon and odors and ointments and frankincense and wine and oil and fine flour and wheat and beasts and sheep and horses and chariots and slaves and souls of men those are the only two times when the word slave is used in the King James Bible and as I mentioned to you earlier there is no way you can read a King James Bible and walk away believing that God is a proponent of slavery you cannot do it but with the fake new Bible versions you can that's why I've spent over 20 years trying to warn people not to use these new fake so-called modern Bible versions Let's see what the real Bible has to say concerning this issue of slavery. In Exodus chapter 21, verse 16, we'll put it on the screen for you. It says, He that stealeth a man and sells him, or if he be found in his hand, he shall surely be put to death. He that stealeth a man and selleth him. If you're going to steal a man, if you're going to steal a human being, for the purpose of selling them, what are you selling them into? You're either selling them into physical slavery or sexual slavery. My King James Bible says, if you do that, you are to die. Does that sound to you like a God that's a proponent of slavery or an opponent of slavery? Let's see what else he says here. Deuteronomy 24-7. If a man be found stealing any of his brethren of the children of Israel and making merchandise of him or selleth him, then that thief shall die, and thou shalt put evil away from among you. Again, God is showing that he strongly disapproves of selling human beings and using them in that manner. So the only way that an atheist can walk away thinking that God is a proponent of slavery is by using the new Bible versions when you see how many times they've used the word slave in these new Bible versions. Now you'll notice in his video, he puts up there some Bible verses. So we're going to take a look at these verses that he puts up there on the screen, and we're going to read them from the real Bible, the King James, and we're going to see if these verses are promoting slavery or not promoting slavery and what we're going to do is we're going to read them in their context because they're pointing you to specific verses it's called cherry picking they cherry pick the Bible finding a verse here a verse there a verse way over here a verse way over here and they string them all together say see that Bible is no good rather than reading it in its entirety 
in context so you can understand what's really going on. So he points you out to Exodus chapter 21, verse 20 to 21. This is what those verses say. Verses 20 and 21 says, If a man smite his servant or his maid with a rod, and he die under his hand, he shall be surely punished. Notwithstanding, if he continue a day or two, he shall not be punished, for he is his money. That's what the verses say. Now what he ignores is verse number 1 to 3 of the same chapter. You see, verse number 1 to 3 puts the context in so that you can know what's being talked about. So let's read verses 1 to 3 of Exodus chapter 21 so that we can understand the context of what's going on. Exodus chapter 21 verses 1 to 3 says this, Now these are the judgments which thou shalt set before them. If thou buy a Hebrew servant, six years he shall serve, and in the seventh he shall go out free for nothing. If he come by himself, he shall go out by himself. If he were married, then his wife shall go out with him. Notice it said in verse 1, actually verse 2, if thou buy a Hebrew servant. They're not talking about Gentiles. As I mentioned in video number one, the atheist is quick to run to the book of Exodus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and Leviticus to try to accuse God of being evil and mean, when they don't understand that these books are books of the Jewish law, books written to the Jews at that time for what they were going through. These were not for the Gentiles, the non-Jews. It was written for the Jews. You'll see in the picture that he presents in his presentation, what does he have? Two white men and a black man. A black man as the slave. Completely missing what the Bible is saying here. They are talking about this happening within the Jewish community buying one of the Hebrew brethren. Now you might say, wait a minute, isn't slavery slavery? Wait a minute, you're, you're completely missing the boat. In those days, people would sell themselves in many cases for several reasons, and the Bible talks about that. Let me give you one. If a person had a debt, a debt that he needed to pay, he didn't have the money, he would sell himself to the person that he owed for a period of time until he worked off the amount that he owed. Let me show you this in the Bible. Matthew 18, 23-25. Therefore the kingdom of heaven likened unto a king, which would take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him, which owed him ten thousand talents. And for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold and his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made. Sometimes people will be sold in order to pay their debts off. Once their debt is paid off, then they're free again. That's how it was back then. There was another way that a person would sell themselves temporarily as a servant for somebody. And that is if they wanted to marry their daughter. They would want to show their worth by working for the father in order to get his daughter. You read about that in Genesis 29, 15 to 20, where Jacob wanted to marry Rachel. So he offered to be the servant of Laban. Rachel's dad for seven years but Rachel's dad took advantage of him and after he had worked for seven years when he thought he was finally going to get his Rachel they have the party and the celebration and everything and it's at night and he goes into his tent and he thinks it's Rachel in there and it's not it's Rachel's ugly sister they had switched on him and when he woke up the next morning and realized that it was Rachel's sister and not Rachel, he was very angry. And Laban said, hey, work for me another seven years and I'll give you Rachel. 
So in those days, they would sell themselves out as servants, whether it be for a debt or whether it be for marriage. That's just how they did back then. But when you present the video in the way that the atheists did, where they got two white guys and a black guy being sold, that's not even what's being talked about here. It completely changed the context because they ignored verses 1 to 3. The words of the Lord are pure words. You don't cherry pick them to try to come to your own conclusions on things. It explains itself. And it's very sad that so many people have been turned away from this King James Bible because of antics like this that are used by atheists. It's very frustrating. They'll take the Bible out of context. They'll cherry pick verses to try to get you to see things the way they want to see it. My recommendation for you, whenever somebody comes to you quoting a verse here or there trying to get you to see their way, you go and get yourself a King James Bible and read the whole chapter. In some cases, read the chapter before, the chapter they're quoting from, and the chapter after it to get the full context of what's really going on. Because oftentimes you're going to find that what they say the Bible says and what the King James Bible actually says are two completely different different things. The other verse that he quotes here is Colossians chapter 3 verse 22 and 20, 20 through 24. This is what it says in the King James Bible. Servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. And whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men. Knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. Again, it's servants, not slaves. They'll want you to believe they're talking about slaves here. But as I mentioned, if you have a job, you are a servant. They may call it master here. Today we'll call it a boss. And he's saying, just do your work heartily as unto the Lord, not with eye service, not just looking like you're working hard, but you're floundering around, but you work as if you're working for the Lord. Completely different than what they're presenting, isn't it? Let's look at the other verse they quote, Ephesians chapter 6, verses 5 through 9. It says, Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, in singleness of heart as unto Christ, not with eye service as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God from your heart, with good will doing service as to the Lord, not unto men, knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same shall he receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or free. And ye masters, do the same thing unto them, forbearing threatening, knowing that your master also is in heaven, neither is there respect of persons with him. So again, he's spelling it out that if you're going to work, do it heartily as unto the Lord, do it as servants of Christ, and then he turns around and tells the masters or the bosses, you are to operate in the same manner. Don't be threatening people. Don't be threatening them. You are under obligation because you have a Lord that's over you. Just like you as the boss is over the employees, Jesus Christ is over you. You think you're going to run the employees over? You're going to answer to Jesus for it. When you look at it from its perspective, it all makes sense. Not talking about, you, you hear the word slave in here anywhere? You don't hear the word slave in here nowhere. We're talking about servants. And I mentioned to you earlier about the difference between servants and slaves. He puts the master under the same category as a servant. Not so when you look at the modern day view of a slave and a master. The Bible puts it all in perspective. The master or the boss is not to overrun the servant or the employees or he'll have to answer to Christ. The servant is to work as if he's working for Christ. The master is to obey as if he is obeying Christ. He's to treat his employee as if he's working for Christ. Has nothing to do with slaves whipping backs and being a proponent of the slavery. And when you get yourself a King James Bible, you cannot use this book and walk away believing that God is a proponent of slavery. It just is not in here. You need to get yourself a King James Bible. If you're an atheist, 
and you're really thinking that God's a proponent of the slavery, you need to get yourself a King James Bible. Read the Bible in its context and don't cherry pick it. And you'll find out that this God, this King James Bible, is very much against slavery. He who the Son sets free is free indeed. Jesus came to set us free. He didn't come to make us slaves as the new Bibles present. It's completely different. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 13 to 25 is another one that they quote here. So let's see what it says. Submit yourself to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme, or unto governors as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers, and for the praise of them that do well. For so is the will of God, that with well-doing ye may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men, as free, and not using, your, liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God. Honor all, men. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the king. Servants, be, subject to, your, masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the forward. For this, is, thankworthy, if a man for conscience toward God endure a grief, suffering wrongfully. For what glory, is it, if, when ye be buffeted for your faults, ye shall take it patiently. But if, when ye do well, and suffer, for it, ye take it patiently, this, is, acceptable with God. For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example, that ye should follow his steps, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who, when he was reviled, reviled not again, when he suffered, he threatened not, but committed, himself, to him that judgeth righteously, who his own self bare our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. For ye were as sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. Again, when you read it in its context, it has nothing to do with slaves, it's talking about, again, the headships, governors, kings, submit yourself to the king, submit yourself to the authorities. It talks about the servants, how they are to be treated. It put everything in the proper perspective of how people are to be treated when it comes to this kind of a hierarchy. Do we live under kings today? No. But we do live under governments and presidents and Congress and governors and mayors and bosses. So we put it in our perspective as to what it's trying to tell us here. Be subservient to the higher authorities as you would to Christ. And that brings honor to the Lord. Nothing wrong there, no heavy lifting, and nothing about slavery or God being a proponent of slavery. I don't get it, guys. The only way they can come to that conclusion is by reading the new versions. But you're not going to come to that conclusion that God is a proponent of slavery reading the King James. So you need to get yourself a King James Bible. That'll solve it for you. Start reading it, believing what it says. Don't cherry pick it. Take it for what it says. And you'll get the answer that you need. And you'll see God for who he really is. Now let's go on to your next question. Question six. Why do bad things happen to good people? It makes no sense. You've created an exotic excuse on God's behalf to rationalize it. Now his next question is, why does bad things happen to good people? Remember I told you the questions get weaker as they go on? Let me show you why this question is a non-question. A question not even worthy of an answer. The question is designed in such a way as to lead you to believe that the reason why something bad happened is because God made it happen. Isn't that the obvious conclusion? But here's the thing that I find very frustrating. The Bible says in Proverbs 11.1, 1, A false balance is an abomination to the Lord, but a just weight is his delight. We've all seen the pictures of the lady with the blindfold holding out the balances of justice. The Bible says a false balance is an abomination to the Lord. And what the atheist does to God is they puts him on a false balance. The way it works is this way. If something good happens, 
we lift our hands in the air and we do our fist pump and we do our dance and we sing our song and we talk about how great we are as human beings and the great accomplishment that we made. When something bad happens, we point our fists at the sky and say, why God, why? Why did you do this? That's a false balance. Why doesn't God get praise when good things happen? Why does he only get the blame when bad things happen? It's a false balance. Another thing that makes this question null and void is that there's too many unanswered questions in the question. Why do bad things happen to good people? Okay, who are the good people you're talking about? Give me some names. No names given. They want you to insert names. No, you're asking the question. You tell me, who are the good people you're talking about? And what's the bad thing that happened to them? And what's your proof that God made that bad thing happen to them? Then we can answer your question. But until you can give me proof that God made something bad happen to them, that's a whole different story. A whole different story there. You have no proof that God made this stuff happen. If somebody trips and falls and breaks their leg, is that God's fault? If somebody gets injured on the job, is that God's fault? Did God make that happen? Somebody gets in a car accident, is it God's fault? Somebody catches a disease, is it God's fault? If so, how? Show me what he did to make this happen. You see, it's too many open questions within the question that makes this whole question null and void. Because they don't have a balanced playing field, they automatically blame God when things go wrong and praise themselves when things go right. That's an uneven balance. And it's a question that's not even worth taking the time to try to answer because it's based on a false pretense that God is making these bad things happen. Next question. Question 7. Why didn't any of Jesus' miracles in the Bible leave behind any evidence? It's very strange, isn't it? You've created an excuse to rationalize it. Now this next one is one I've been waiting for. I love questions like this because what I want to do is, guys, sit back, grab yourself a lemon iced tea, like I do, and relax a little bit because we're going to have some fun. I love this. For those of you who watched video number one, you knew when I got to the science part, I was going to have some fun. And that's where the most fun of the video was, where I was showing you all these things that are mentioned in my King James Bible that deals with science that the atheist didn't even know was in here. Quantum physics, atoms, all kinds of stuff, the wind cycle, water cycle, all these other things that are mentioned in the King James Bible that I didn't even know was in there. Well, here we go, guys. His question is... Why aren't there any miracles left behind? <laughs> uh, this question is arrived at because the atheist doesn't know who Jesus is. They don't know who he is. They think Jesus began in a manger in Bethlehem. And they don't understand that Jesus Christ is the God of the Old Testament that was doing all of those miracles for the children of Israel and for the prophets. The Bible says twice, no man has seen God at any time. Yet all through the Old Testament, God shows up over and over and over and over again. He showed up to Adam and Eve. He showed up to Solomon, David, Isaiah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, just to name a few. In Exodus chapter 6, he said, I appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Are you going to call him a liar? So if the Bible said no man has seen God any time, yet God is appearing all throughout the Old Testament, then there must be more to God than you and I understand. That's why we Christians have a teaching that we call the Trinity. The King James Bible calls it the Godhead. 
And in the King James Bible, it explains it in 1 John chapter 5, verse 7. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. And verse 8, there are three that bear witness on earth, the Spirit, the Blood, and the Water, and these three agree in one. It says in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost are one. Remember I warned you earlier about these new Bible versions and how they destroy the Bible? You'll see if you look into any of these new Bible versions, 1 John chapter 5, verse 7, they took out the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. They completely took it out. Completely took it out. And they took verse 8, the Spirit, the Blood, and the Water, and they put that in its place. They took out the reference that one is talking about in heaven and the other is talking about on earth. They completely took that out because they don't want you to know the true nature of God. And they'll put in the footnote, the earliest manuscripts don't contain this. That's a lie. That's a lie. The Catholic manuscripts don't contain it. What I want to do with this video series is I not only want to reach atheists, but I know many atheists, they're not going to change, no matter how many questions I answer. I know many of them are not going to change. And for them, it's not really about not believing in God. It's they enjoy their lifestyle. And they don't want to be accountable to a higher power. So believing in God is considered a, an, a, a problem for many of them. They don't want to believe that there is a higher power they have to answer to. So they'll just choose to ignore that he exists. And they're rolling the dice that he doesn't exist. But you see, I realize I can't reach most of them. But what I'd like to do is I'd like to take those of you who are wondering. The stories in this Bible, some of them sound unbelievable. But does that mean they're untrue? The archaeologists have been very busy overseas digging up things. And they would use this Bible as their map. Because there's so many things in this Bible that tells you where places are located back then. And it's amazing that the archaeologists begin to go digging in the places where this King James Bible says places are located. And they're finding the ruins. They're finding these ancient cities that have been buried. They're finding artifacts and fragments. They're finding the evidence that the stories that are mentioned in this King James Bible, even though it sounds unbelievable, Many of these stories are written by eyewitnesses. We got to remember that. Many of these stories are written by eyewitnesses to the events. It's easy for us to say it didn't happen. We weren't there. They were there. They wrote it down. And not only did they write it down, but they made sure that it was preserved for all generations so that we, thousands of years later, are still able to read about what happened to them there. And if we doubt what happens, we send the archaeologists over there with the shovels and they begin to verify, yes, indeed, this did happen. So I want to build the faith of my Christian brothers and sisters out there. And I'm going to let you know, you're not going to be able to find this stuff in the new versions. Because they're translated from the wrong manuscripts. The King James Bible is the only one in English that's translated from the Jewish, correct Jewish manuscripts. The only one. You're not going to get better than this. The new Bible versions are translated from the Catholic manuscripts, which have radically changed what those manuscripts were supposed to say. They left out a bunch of stuff. They threw in a bunch of stuff. And when you follow them, you get lost. You can't figure out what's going on anymore. But with this King James Bible, it's translated from the copies of those manuscripts that traces back to the original. And we can be certain that we can trust what's here, mainly based upon the stuff you're about to see. I want to build your faith by showing you evidence. The atheist says, why aren't there no miracles left behind? They don't understand. Jesus Christ is the God of the Old Testament that did all these miracles. And there's a lot that was left behind. So I want to show you and help build your faith. Let's start off first of all with this. Why is it that every year the Jewish people celebrate the Passover? Passover was celebrated every year in early spring. It was the main Jewish holiday celebrating the time in the Exodus when God delivered the Israelites from slavery in Egypt. 
Now, the Passover meal was eaten in remembrance of God passing over the houses of those who had sacrificed a lamb and sprinkled its blood on the wooden doorposts and mantles, while the angel of death visited those who had not sprinkled the blood of the lamb. The Hebrew scriptures tell us that the angel of death was the final of 10 plagues that God had sent to save the Israelites from Egyptian bondage. Now, the theme of the Jewish Passover was remembering the gift of salvation from slavery in Egypt. The Passover lamb was to be perfect and flawless and without blemish. It was to have no bones broken when sacrificed. Those who were covered by the blood of the lamb were saved from the angel of death. Remember when John the baptizer first saw Jesus coming toward him at the Jordan River? He declared, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, John 1, 29. It turns out that Jesus' role as the Lamb of God is central to the gospel message. Many believe that Jesus was the fulfillment of centuries of Passovers that had been observed before him. For many scholars, the slaying of the Passover lamb in order for the death angel to pass over those who were covered by the blood is the prophetic picture of Jesus. Another thing left behind, in the book of Genesis, we have the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. Some people get very uncomfortable about this story, but I'm not here to water down the Bible. I'm here to tell you what it said. In the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, the sins of these cities, it's not just Sodom and Gomorrah, by the way, it's Sodom, Gomorrah, and the cities of the plain. There were several cities in that location that fell into that same category. Sodom and Gomorrah, the sins that they have done in these places, had risen up to the level where God had to address it. But as you know, when you read the King James Bible all the way through, God does not take pleasure in killing human beings. He doesn't. And when you read the Bible all the way through, as I have, you will learn that before God rains down judgment, he will often give you an opportunity to repent. And this is what he offered to the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah and others. He came down, he spoke to Abraham, told Abraham what he intended to do. Because of the sins of these cities, they had to be wiped out. Abraham decided that he was going to defend the cities and he asked the Lord, if I find 50 righteous people, would you spare the city? And God said, yeah, I'll spare it for 50. That's the mercy of God. Abraham didn't stop at 50. He kept going down and got all the way down to 10. If I can find 10 righteous people in the city, would you spare it? God says, I'll spare it for 10. That's mercy, folks. He didn't have to spare it at all. So Abraham goes down and he cannot find 10 people in that city that was willing to live a righteous lifestyle. So God sends two angels to a man named Lot, who was one of the prominent men there in the city. Lot went in and tried to find people. And even members of his own family laughed at him. They did not want to believe that God would rain down judgment on them because of their sin. The men of the city saw these two angels go into Lot's house. They didn't know they were angels. They thought they were men. So they came to Lot's house and said, send these men out to us that we may know them. In the King James Bible, to know someone is a sexual term. They were asking for Lot to send these two angels out so that they could have sex with them. Now, those of you who know the King James Bible, Genesis chapter 6, that's what ended up happening. The fallen angels came down, the humans began to sexually procreate with them, and the land became so corrupt, God had to wipe it out with the great flood in the days of Noah. God was not going to allow this to happen again. If you don't believe that that's what was really going on, just look at what Lot said to the men that were asking that he send these angels out. He says, I have two daughters who have never known of man. I'll send them out. Do to them as you will. Now some of you say, well, that's awful. Yeah, it is awful. 
But that's where Lot was, in his mind and in his heart. It's not right. But it lets you see from the King James Bible what those men were actually asking for. They were not asking him to come out and get to know the guys like brothers. They were asking for sex with these angels. And these angels were having none of it. That's why the cities were destroyed. The angels took Lot, his wife, and his daughters and told them, leave, get out of here. And once they left, the Bible says God rained down fire and brimstone from God in heaven and wiped out the cities of Sodom, Gomorrah, and the cities of the plain, converting these cities into ash. Now you might say, that's a very fanciful story you got there, young man, but what's the proof? When I was growing up, I was told that the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed and cast into the Dead Sea. When I got older and began to think for myself and to research the King James Bible for myself, I discovered that the Bible said that the things that were done to Sodom and Gomorrah were done as an example so that we wouldn't do what they did. We wouldn't do the sin that they did. If he destroyed the cities as an example, why would he destroy it and then cover up the evidence that he did it? They needed to be a visible example for us to see. So there were some who said the cities must still be on the ground. It must still be where we can see them. And they went about looking around the Dead Sea to see if they could find the remains of the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. And what they found shows you that what this King James Bible says, although it may sound unbelievable to us, the archaeologists are finding out that this book is the best history book ever given to man. When it says there was a city that was destroyed and how it was destroyed, that's how it was destroyed. Let's take a look at the video of people who've gone there and found the city of Sodom and showing you the proof that this has to be the city and help build your faith that what the Bible says happened, happened. As the atheists are asking, show us miracles left behind by Jesus. Here's a miracle of a destroyed city, destroyed with fire and brimstone at the very location where the Bible said the city was. Converted to ash, just like the Bible said. And brimstone, by the way, is sulfur. So let's take a look at the video and see if the Bible is telling the truth. The Bible tells us the cities were in the plain of Jordan, which is the area surrounding the Dead Sea, and it was once a beautiful, lush area. At 1,300 feet below sea level, this is the lowest place on earth, a very hot and desolate region that was cursed by God because of the sins of the people. Flavius Josephus, the first century Jewish historian tells us, there are still the remainders of that divine fire and the traces of the five cities are still to be seen. Popular thought has it that the cities were later covered by the waters of the Dead Sea, but if Josephus could see the cities in his day, then we should be able to view them also, as the water level has, if anything, receded since his time. Driving along the coastal highway of the Dead Sea in Israel, one can soon see peculiar formations that are of a lighter color than the surrounding terrain. These are the ashen cities, destroyed by the wrath of God. These cities were consumed by intense flames, a supernatural heat that was directed by the hand of God. Today there is ash that is of lighter color than the surrounding mountains and terrain. As mentioned in the Bible, this is a desolate area where nothing grows. Inspecting the formations closely, one can see structures containing man-made elements, such as 90-degree angles. Even though the buildings were consumed by the fire, the remaining ash in these cities is comprised of a heavier material due to the inclusion of brimstone or sulfur and still retains some of the original shapes of man-made structures. 
Looking down the city streets, one can notice man-made shapes which are not found in nature. Here we see a building with square sides or 90 degree angles. From the opposite side, we can see the same symmetrical structure and man-made angles. We can see the remains of walls that extended outward at 90 degree angles from the main structure. Once again, further evidence of man-made construction. Here we can see square windows that are visible in the walls of the structures, which give us a view of the past. Scanning the city for signs of prior habitation, we can see in the foreground a tower of cylindrical design, positioned at the edge of the city. The remains have suffered greatly during 3,500 years of wind and rain erosion. Even still, there is the appearance here of streets and man-made structures. Within these areas are many unusual shapes. These certainly defy attempts to explain their origin by natural causes. When examined closely, their uniqueness becomes even more apparent. Remarkable shapes can still be seen in the ash. Such is this sphinx shape. Here we are standing in the ashen remains of what we believe is Gomorrah and there's this odd singular shape standing up by itself. There's nothing anywhere around it. It seems to be on a bit of a rise. We believe this could have been a sphinx perhaps guarding one of the corners of the city. Entering the remains one is immediately impressed by the magnitude of them. These were big cities. Prior to the destruction recorded in the Bible, a large population had flourished here for some time before the sudden destruction came. Recent findings reveal just how large that population was. The ancient Canaanites buried their dead, and archaeologists across the valley from this site have found huge Canaanite burial grounds. Conservative estimates put the number of these graves at well over one million. It's fallen down from up high. And it's quite hard. The remains consist largely of calcium sulfate. Calcium sulfate is a byproduct when limestone is burnt with sulfur. This is exactly what one would expect to find. This shows up in the ruins as alternating layers of pure calcium sulfate and calcium carbonate with silicates, remains of limestone and other materials used in the construction of these cities. And very much like ash. Whereas the white layers remained fairly hard. Here in the ashen remains of Gomorrah we find exactly what we'd expect to find if this was indeed an ancient city. We find geometric shapes such as this tower here or this ziggurat shape in the background. One of the best evidences though is the sulphur balls and come with us now we'll show you those right now. Are they all along the same line? Yeah, it looks like it. Yep. Yeah, a little ball, there's a few there. And they're just sitting in the layers of straight ash. Okay. 
Look at that. That is pure sulfur. The brimstone has been tested and proves to be extremely pure elemental sulfur combined with small amounts of magnesium. This will be a really nice sample. In fact, it's so pure it burns very, very easily, as Aaron demonstrates here. <coughs> oh, that's strong. <coughs> 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 The fumes it gives off can be overpowering. Whoa! You have to go back to the Bible and check. <laughs> yeah, what would that be? It's in the Bible that it can be an eternal fire, and here's the proof. It's still burning. Yeah. The Bible describes five cities that were destroyed, and to the north of the Dead Sea is another of the sites identified by Ron. This one was the city of Admar. Again, the white ashen ruins stand out distinctly from the surrounding desert. This area smells of sulphur, yet there is no geothermal activity here. As with all sites examined, it is far above the Dead Sea too high to attribute to sedimentary deposits from the lake. And again, symmetrical formations are apparent. For example, these rectangular shapes, which perhaps were once stone blocks. Is that sulphur you found the big bit? Yeah. Oh yeah. It's a good bit. and brimstone is present in the ash. And here charcoal can be found in the ash also. The evidence found supports the biblical account of how these sites were destroyed. Greetings ladies and gentlemen, Jason Zelda here. I'm going to be interrupting the video right here in the middle. The actual length of this video came out to be nearly two hours and I've been trying to edit it down so that it wouldn't be so long. It still came out to be about an hour and 45 minutes and I didn't want you guys to have to sit here through a long hour 45 minute video. So what I decided to do is to break the video up into two parts. So here is where I'll end the first video and then we'll resume it on the next one. It'll be Answering the Atheist video number two, part B. On part B, we're going to be uncovering some more things, miracles that Jesus left behind in the Old Testament. You're going to see evidence of the Dead Sea Crossing, Mount Sinai, and the artifacts that are still there today that have been verified even by the Saudi government as being authentic. Even though it's Muslim country, authenticating Jewish material there in their land by putting a barbed wire fence and a guardhouse in front of Mount Sinai. We're going to be uh, dealing with that, getting some information out to you, helping to build your faith in Jesus Christ and in this King James Bible. That's my bottom line and my goal. I know most atheists are not going to believe no matter how much evidence that I show. But the least that I want to do is to be able to present you all with so much evidence to show you that even though in this King James Bible some of the stories may sound unbelievable, when you see the archaeological evidence as I've been showing you, hopefully it's helping to build your faith. Um, one of my things I wonder is, why is it that pastors, ministers, and evangelists have not been presenting this information to Christians to let them know what's happening, the artifacts, the things that the archaeologists are finding. How come this information is being suppressed? That's what I'd like to know. So hopefully this is helping you out and we're going to get started on video B. <laughs> The
This is the Answering the Atheist video number two, part B. We're going to resume where we left off on part A, and we're going to jump right into the discovery of the real Mount Sinai. The Catholic Church said that Mount Sinai is in Egypt, and they built a monastery there called St. Catherine's. But the King James Bible says Sinai is in Arabia. And when archaeologists began to look in Arabia, they began to find some very interesting things when they followed along the pathway that the children of Israel followed as portrayed in the King James Bible. You're going to see the evidence that was left behind and the miracle of the burnt up mountaintop of Mount Sinai that the King James Bible says the mountain burned because God came down upon it you're going to see firsthand the evidence up close to help build your faith in Jesus Christ and in what this King James Bible says. We're also going to answer the other questions that the atheist asked. So I'm not going to waste any time. We're going to jump right into it. Hopefully you guys are enjoying the presentation that's being given here. And uh, I'll talk with you guys again at the end of the video. Older maps will reveal that Median is in northwest Saudi Arabia. This is where we should find the mountain of God today. Moses was tending sheep when he encountered a mysterious burning bush that was not being consumed. The Lord said to Moses, When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. Paul, in the New Testament, told us the location of Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai in Arabia. Josephus told us Mount Sinai is the highest of mountains in the region of the city of Median. This is our destination, the real Mount Sinai in Saudi Arabia, and is named today Jebel al Laws. Herschel Shanks, editor of the Biblical Archaeology Review, stated, Jebel El Laz is the most likely site for Mount Sinai. From the Saudi shore at the Gulf of Aqaba, we first inspect the remains of the pillar that once had Hebrew inscriptions on it, but was removed by the Saudis after Ron Wyatt showed it to the authorities. Today, a Red Sea coastal survey plate marks the location of the column. Our first destination is Elam, where the children of Israel would find water to drink. Then they came to Elam, where there were 12 wells of water and 70 palm trees, so they camped there by the waters. Using Google Earth, we are able to zoom in to the location of Elam. It stands out with all the green palm trees grouped together in the canyon or wadi. On the ground, we can see the circular wells still in operation today. Of course, there are more than 70 palm trees here today, but amazingly, 12 wells are still here at Elam. The children of Israel would have been stretched out through the canyons here for a great distance, but they would have access to the drinking water at these wells. And they journeyed from Elam, and all the congregation of the children of Israel came to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai. Next, the children of Israel traveled through the wilderness of Sin and murmured against Moses. The Lord lovingly provided them with manna every day, except the Sabbath. On a detailed map next to the town of Al-Bad, or ancient Median, we can see Mugair Shuayab, meaning the caves of Jethro. Here we see the name Jethro listed on the map. The facades of these caves were carved by the Nabidians in more recent times, 2,000 years ago. 
but the inner caves themselves date back to the time of the Exodus and Jethro, 3,500 years ago. And the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock at Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and water will come out of it, that the people may drink. Northwest of Jebel El Laws is the rock of Horeb that we will explore next. Standing on the crest of a hill, the singular rock stands 50 feet tall and can easily be seen from a great distance. As the people complained once again asking for water, the Lord heard their cries and he commanded Moses to strike the rock. Then water gushed out in abundance. The rock was split down the middle, from top to bottom, by the hand of God. Erosion can be seen around the rock, from millions of gallons of water flowing out into the nearby camp. He opened the rock, and water flowed out. The fissure is so large, one can walk through the split in the rock. The rocks below show clear signs of water erosion. And Moses built an altar and called its name the Lord is my banner. Here in the encampment is a large square altar assembled with uncut stones and was built after the defeat of the Amalekites. Also in the encampment are the remains of these circular formations of stone used around the base of their tents. This is clear evidence of prior occupation at this site. Our next destination is Jebel al Laws, or Mount Sinai, the mountain of God. As we pan across the mountains, we see the peak of Mount Sinai that was burned by the presence of God. The blackened peak of Mount Sinai marks the location where the mountain was on fire. Mount Sinai was completely in smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire. Its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mountain quaked greatly. To the right of the peak is the location of Elijah's cave. It is extremely rare for anyone to obtain video of the mountain, since entering Saudi Arabia is very difficult, and they are guarding this mountain from those who would photograph it. Near the base of the mountain are the guardhouse and fence, which surround the area where many artifacts are located that help to authenticate the site. This Saudi sign states, Archaeological Area, Warning, Unlawful to Trespass. Violators are subject to penalties passed by royal decree. Using Google Earth, one can zoom in and see the guardhouse and fence, which are next to the sign. In the encampment area are many inscriptions, including this wonderful image of a menorah, which is undoubtedly the oldest ever found. Also found in the encampment was this broken millstone, that would have ground up the manna that was collected. And Moses wrote all the words of the Lord, and he rose early in the morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain, and twelve pillars according to the twelve tribes of Israel. Google Earth shows us the altar at the base of the mountain with an animal pen next to it that would have held animals to be sacrificed. Here we can see an entrance into the animal pen. 
The remains of pillars are in this area also. Some pillars are white in color, while others have more of a granite appearance and are very large in diameter, as we can see here. From this same area, one can look upward and see the burned and blackened peak. The rock has literally been burned from the intense heat. When Moses was on the mountain with God, a golden calf was built in the camp by a rebellious group. As Moses was descending the mountain, he saw the people dancing around the golden calf. Here we can see the encampment from the mountain and the location of the altar for the golden calf. Using Google Earth, we can zoom in on the large boulders which comprise the base of the altar. On the ground, we can see the massive large boulders and the fence erected by the Saudi authorities in an effort to preserve this site. Again, we have the government sign warning visitors to keep out. It was on top of these large boulders that the golden calf was placed 11 of the 12 tribes, save the tribe of Levi, danced around the golden calf in rebellion to God. Panning from Mount Sinai, we peer through the fence and see amazing images that are inscribed on the rocks. Egyptian-style figures of the Egyptian god Hathor have been placed here like graffiti. The bull was placed in high esteem in Egypt, where the children of Israel had just left, so they created images that came natural to their rebellious heart. These images were inscribed here because the golden calf was resting here at the time. These inscriptions are unique to Saudi Arabia, according to a Saudi archaeologist. Moses asks Aaron, I've come down the mountain, what on earth has happened here? And Aaron says, I took the ornaments from them, I took their gold, and I put it into the fire, and out popped this calf. But he makes it very plain that there was a single calf. I built the altar, I put it on the altar, and I turned to the people and I said, These be thy gods, plural, O Israel, which have led thee up out of the land of Egypt. It's something struck me very strange about that, because if you put one golden calf atop an altar, why would you say, these be thy gods, O Israel, if you've got one golden calf? Did he make more than one golden calf? You know, it, it puzzled me for a good length of time. Like Bob and Larry, the Caldwells look for the scriptural indicators. In studying some of the Hebrew, it says that Aaron fashioned the calf with a graving tool. It literally says, to engrave, as in something we would engrave a name on today. That sounds very strange because you, you, you mold something that's molten. You don't engrave it. But the way you built an altar in Egypt was to, in relief, cover it with gods and then put a chief deity, a statue of the chief deity, on it. If a golden calf were to have been put on the top, that scripture would not contradict itself. It would absolutely perfectly fit. And he would have placed it atop and said, in fact, these be thy gods, O Israel, which have led thee up out of the land of Egypt. When you go there, you can read the Bible like a map. And it says, this is here. Then you go for 10 steps, and this is here. For lots of people our age, you have to smack them in the face for them to believe something. Most of the, today's generation doesn't want to accept things that they can't see and touch and feel. You know, when you show them something like the Bible, and what it says, you know, this isn't just a story that somebody's trying to teach you in Sunday school. This is something real, and here's the proof. The top of Sinai is very black, darkened rock. It has a uh, appearance of, in, in some light, coal. It's extremely interesting because the closer you get up toward the blackened peak, you can see 
where the red, red granite folds down and the black begins. And it's a dividing line that is like night and day. In some light, it actually has a blue tinge to it. And one of the verses in scripture talks about the top of the mountain as if it were a sapphire stone. Especially toward noonday, it gets a shiny patina on it to where it looks like you're walking around on obsidian. It is literally that shiny and that black. When you stand there and you look all the way around you, there are convoluted mountain ranges going off in every direction. And there are none that are the color of the one you're standing on. It is black and every bit of the rest of it is a red, burnished, brownish granite as far as the eye can see. From high atop the mountain, Jim and Penny see the V-shaped altar of sacrifice. The altar of sacrifice is what inspired us to continue to go back to the mountain. This is where the pillars are. And what are they doing there? These huge stone pillars. Again, civilization would have been required to construct these. It says in chapter 24 of Exodus that Moses got up early, he erected 12 pillars, he built an altar there at the base of the mountain, and then he brings oxen in for sacrifice. Recent excavations show evidence of ancient ash deep in the soil at this site. The 12 pillars were signifying the 12 tribes of Israel. What would we have for pillars? We found these white stone pillars, about 22, 24 inches in diameter. They're kind of a white, soft, marbleish type material. They would have stacked right on top of one another. Uh, ancient Egyptian photographs show that this is a style of building a, a pillar type formation. Now we don't know it's an altar. If it's a rock formation, whatever it is, but I mean, what is it doing there? And, and why 12 pillars? And, and why not nine? Why not 14? Why 12? The Bible says it was of uncut stone and no steps. I mean, the precision of, of Scripture in here is amazing because it calls out that this altar is located right at the foot of the mountain. And sure enough, there it sat. From that moment forward, it was my mission, Penny and I together and the kids, we were going to document everything we could about it. Because our greatest fear was that once the Saudis realized exactly what they may have, they would come in with bulldozers and eliminate it. Hopefully, I have sufficiently answered the question as to miracles left behind. The Passover is a miracle based upon the 10 miracles that were dropped on Egypt. In video number one, we dealt with Noah's flood and the evidence that happened there. We've dealt with the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah and what happened there. And we're going to deal with another one in a future question as well. I'm not sure how much more documentation the atheist would want, but the question was presented in such a way as he thought we didn't have any answers. But we do. So now we're going to go on to the next question. Question number eight. How do we explain the fact that Jesus has never appeared to you? Jesus is all-powerful and timeless, but if you pray for Jesus to appear, nothing happens. You have to create a weird rationalization to deal with this discrepancy. So he wants to know, how come Jesus doesn't appear to us visibly just because we ask? It's simple. Jesus is not a genie in a bottle where you rub the bottle and he comes out. That's why. Nowhere in the Bible does it say just because you ask him to show up, he's going to show up. He already told you when he comes back, every eye will see him. As the lightning shines in the east and is seen in the west, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. When he comes back, everybody's going to see him. He's not doing personal appearances for people. When you hear these TV preachers and stuff talking about God appeared to them, that's hogwash. That's baloney. Any time when God appeared to people in this Bible, their lives were changed forever. They were not the same person. Don't believe this story of people talking about you know, God appearing to them. Jesus never said he was going to appear to you individually. He never said he was going to appear to you visibly, individually. Again, why hold him to something he never said he was going to do? He already told you he's going to come back. And when he comes back, everybody's going to see him. But he's not going to give you your own personal appearance. He never said he would. Next question. Question nine. 
Why would Jesus want you to eat his body and drink his blood? It sounds totally grotesque, doesn't it? Why would an all-powerful God want you to do something that, in any other context, sounds like a disgusting, cannibalistic, satanic ritual? Okay, they want to know about eating the flesh and drinking the blood. This is one of those issues that gets very frustrating because the answer to the question is in the King James Bible, all he had to do was keep reading. That's all he had to do was keep reading. Jesus gave the explanation as to why he said that. And it had nothing to do with cannibalism. It just gets very frustrating. Because people have had their hearts turned away from God because of questions like this taken completely out of context, completely out of context, to try to make God look as bad as they can make him look. Let's get down to the bottom line. What's the context of the story? Why did Jesus make such a statement? He was talking with the religious leaders of his day. When Jesus walked this earth, the one group of people that hated his guts were the religious people. The scribes and the Pharisees. Always trying to trick them. Always trying to trap them. The scholars. Always trying to trick them. Always trying to trap them. And what he would do when he dealt with these religious leaders is he would talk to them in parables. Because he knew they didn't care what he had to say. He would talk to them in parables. Earthly stories to have a spiritual meaning. And they would never ask him what do these parables mean. Because they were the scholars. They were the intelligent ones. So they felt they already knew what he meant. And they would always be wrong. He would make a statement like, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. And them in their scholarly minds believed that they knew what he was talking about. So they assumed that he was talking about their Jewish temple. Destroying their Jewish temple and rebuilding it in three days. But the Bible says he spoke of the temple of his body. Destroy this temple, and in three days, I will raise it up again. For those of you, by the way, who are in religions that teaches you that Jesus is not God, I would like for you to take a look at that verse and read it over and over and over until you understand what Jesus said. We know that God raised Jesus from the dead. Listen to what Jesus said. Destroy this temple, this body. He spoke of the temple of his body. Destroy this temple. And in three days, I will raise it up. I will raise my own body up, he said. If God raised Jesus from the dead, and Jesus said, destroy this temple, this body, and in three days, I will raise it up. Then who does that make Jesus? Jesus. He must be God. God raised Jesus from the dead. Jesus said he'll raise himself from the dead in three days. They assumed he was talking about their Jewish temple. They were wrong. They didn't understand him. He was talking about his body. Later on in the Bible it says, Know ye not that your bodies are the temple of God? It brings it up again. Why? Jesus made the statement. It's picked up and it's repeated over here. He makes this statement that sounds so outrageous at the time because they didn't understand, but it sticks in your mind. And then later on, the understanding comes and you go, now I get it. Same thing is true with this one here. The religious leaders, whenever they get cornered by Jesus, would always revert back to Abraham or Moses. And Jesus was establishing, yes, the children of Israel, they ate manna in the desert. They ate the bread from God, but they still died. And God has sent you the living bread. And he was that bread. Jesus Christ was the bread. The, the bread of life that was sent from God. In the Old Testament, they had this manna sent from God every day, except for the Sabbath. But they would eat that manna, and they still died. So Jesus comes as the living bread and he's using this symbolic speech that they didn't understand 
but he would explain it to his disciples just a little bit later, right here in the King James Bible. He told them, they ate the bread, they died. But here is the living bread, and when you eat this bread, you'll live. He said, you eat my flesh, and you drink my blood. My flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. And these scholars and these educated people, the scribes, the Pharisees, lost their minds because they thought just like this atheist. Oh, he's talking about cannibalism. That's disgusting. No, he wasn't talking about cannibalism. In John chapter 6, verse 66, 666, John chapter 6, verse 66, when Jesus made that statement, it said, many parted and followed him no more. They misunderstood the word of God. And rather than going to the word of God, Jesus Christ is called the word of God. In John chapter 1 and in the book of Revelation, he's called the word. In the book of 1 John chapter 5, verse 7, in the King James Bible, Jesus is called the word. He is the word of God. Instead of going to the word of God to find out what he meant, they simply assumed that they knew. Just like this atheist and they parted and followed him no more. You've heard of Bible codes? Bible codes, they only work for the manuscripts the King James Bible is translated from. They don't work for the manuscripts the New Bibles are translated from. Because the King James is translated from those manuscripts, the King James Bible has codes in it too. And while the manuscripts tend to have letter codes, letter sequence codes, the King James Bible tends to have number codes in it. And it's very interesting that John chapter 6, verse 66, 666, is a passage where the people misunderstood the word of God and walked away never to follow it again. Rather than reading it to get the understanding. At 666, they walked away from the Word of God. Think that's coincidence? I don't. So what did he mean by eating his flesh and drinking his blood? When you look at the full context where he's talking about the children of Israel, they had bread in the wilderness, but they ate that bread and they died. Yet Jesus is coming to be the living bread to give to mankind that if we eat of this bread we're going to live. He took his disciples aside and explained to them what he meant. And he took bread and he broke the bread. And he says this is my body broken for you. Take it. And eat it. And do this in remembrance of me. Did he didn't, he didn't rip off some flesh and hand it to him and say, here's my flesh, eat this. As a cannibal would want you to think, or as an atheist would want you to think. That's not what he did. He took bread that would symbolize his body. He broke it. See, he knew they would remember that statement that he made earlier about eating the flesh and drinking the blood. And now he's explaining, this bread symbolizes my flesh, which is going to be broken. It's broken for you. Breaking the bread. Take this and eat it. Take this bread. As a reminder of what I'm doing for you. Then he takes the wine and he gives it to them. And he says, this is the New Testament in my blood. He didn't cut his wrist and pour blood in there and say, drink this. He used wine as a symbol of his blood. And said, this is the New Testament in my blood. Take it and drink it. Do this in remembrance of me. It had nothing to do with cannibalism. He made a statement back here 
that he knew would stick in their mind so that he would then over here show them this is what I meant by that and what he did that day we call today the communion remember I mentioned earlier a miracle left behind by Jesus the communion why is it that we Christians celebrate communion several times a year where we break the bread and we drink the wine or the grape juice why because Jesus expressly told us to do so to do it in remembrance of him until he returns we would not have had that strong message if he hadn't made that statement about eating his flesh and drinking his blood he dropped that on us so that we would have an understanding of something that would stick in our head the same way when he told those Jewish leaders destroy this temple and in three days I'll raise it up they never forgot that you know why because when he was on that cross what did the Jewish leaders say you who destroyed the temple in three days and raise it again bring yourself down off that cross they remembered what he said they remembered what he said the same way when he made that statement about eating his flesh and drinking his blood his disciples remembered what he said they knew he wasn't talking about cannibalism he was creating a ceremony for us all who are Christians the breaking of the bread symbolizing his body that would be broken for us the drinking of the wine or the grape juice as some churches do to symbolize the blood that he shed for us to give us a new testament under the old testament we were under thou shall not thou shall not thou shall not thou shall not and we couldn't live under that it was too hard for us so he took those old ordinances and he nailed them to his cross when he died and then he comes and he gives us a new testament and this new testament is a testament of grace god showing his mercy to a rebellious human race that to this day even though jesus did all these things for us if you understand what he went through going to the cross the whipping that he took the beating that he took from the Roman soldiers the crown of thorns placed upon his head being paraded down the street where the people mocked him and spat on him in the whole nine yards and then nailing him to the cross and hanging him on it under that hot Israeli sun and if that wasn't bad enough the Roman soldier taking his spear and ramming it into his side and piercing him all the way up in blood and water poured out the Bible said all that he did there symbolized in the breaking of that bread he didn't want us to forget what he did in that cup the wine the grape juice that some churches use symbolizing that he's giving us a new testament now grace mercy from God and this grace and this mercy has endured now for almost 2,000 years he's shown mercy to the human race wanting us to come to Jesus Christ come to his word to learn who he really is he's been very patient for nearly 2,000 years with the human race how much more patience is he going to have on a human race that does this to the one who died for us name another God on the face of this earth whose name is used every day on television radio internet podcasts every form of communication that I can think of there's only one God's name who is used every day as a curse word and that's Jesus Christ after all he did for us it's his name that this world chooses to use to swear by and to curse people how long do you think he's gonna put up with that he's showing us mercy guys he wants you to come to him for forgiveness you can't earn it being good is not gonna get you to heaven being religious is not gonna get you to heaven you'll find that nowhere in the Bible the Bible says our good works are like filthy rags in God's face he didn't ask you to do good works 
He asks you to believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for forgiveness of sins. If you want to be an atheist, that's your choice. But if you're being an atheist based upon false information that's been given to you, I've been answering every single question you guys have tossed at me. Backing up with documentation, scientific documentation, archaeological documentation, Bible documentation. If you still choose not to believe, it's not my fault. I'm trying. I don't hate you. I haven't screamed not one time. I haven't called your names or nothing. But ask yourself. Why do so many of you use the name of Jesus Christ as a curse word? What has he ever done bad to you? What has he ever done to you that you use his name as a curse word? The answer to your question is simple. It had nothing to do with cannibalism. Jesus made a statement so that it would stick in your head. Just like when he told the Jewish leaders, destroy this temple and in three days I'll raise it up again. The thought of their temple being destroyed was anathema to them. They couldn't stand that thought. And they never forgot it. They never forgot that he said it. And when he made the statement about eating his flesh and drinking his blood, they never forgot that statement. But they never asked him what he meant. But his disciples did. And they got the answer. That he was going to break his body. His body was going to be broken for us. And his blood was going to be shed for us. And we were to do this, drinking the wine, eating the broken bread, in remembrance of him. It had nothing to do with cannibalism. Nothing whatsoever, when you read it in its context. Let's go to the next question. Finally, question number 10. Why do Christians get divorced at the same rate as non-Christians? Christians get married in front of God and their Christian friends, all of whom are praying to God for the marriage to succeed. And then they say, what God has put together, let no man put asunder. God is all-powerful, so if God has put two people together, that should seal the deal, shouldn't it? Yet Christians get divorced at the same rate as everyone else. To explain this, you have to create some kind of convoluted rationalization. Okay, divorce. Divorce in Christianity. Well, it's real simple, guys. It's real simple. Your question is based upon this concept that just because the marriage vow says, whom the Lord has brought together, let no one tear asunder, you assume that God brought those two together. Who is to say that he did? Can we just be honest for a moment? It may have been sex that brought them together. It may have been money that brought them together. It might have been necessity that brought them together. It may have been love that brought them together. But just because the marriage vow says God brought them together doesn't mean that he did. It's basic, simple, easy. No heavy lifting there. The Bible already told you, by the way, why divorce is the way that it is. It says here in the book of Matthew, chapter 19, verse 8, He said unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your heart, suffered you to put away your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. Because of the hardness of man's heart, divorce was permitted. That's why. Just because we're Christians don't mean we're perfect. Never claim to be. We're human beings. We make mistakes just like everybody else. The difference is we come to Jesus Christ for forgiveness. We understand who we are and what we are. And we ask for forgiveness and we try to do the right things. And it doesn't always work every time. It doesn't always work for us down here. But we know that in the end, he that began a good work is faithful to complete it. Marriages might not last. Friendships might not last. But one thing that we know, there's nothing that's going to pull us out of the hands of Jesus Christ. The Bible said so. And that's it. Your ten questions are answered. I'm Jason Zelda, and I want to thank you guys for watching the video. 
and I hope I have given you guys some information that you can uh, build on and grow upon. You can research some more to find out more. I appreciate you taking your time out to watch the video. And I want to say thank you to all of those who watched the videos that I've put together. Uh, those of you who sent comments, I really look forward to those comments uh, because I never know when I put together a video like this if anybody's going to watch, if anybody's going to care, or anything. So when I get a comment from somebody, it at least lets me know you're out there. And I want to say thank you also to those who have donated. There was a lady who had contacted me recently asking me uh, about donating to this ministry, and I'm like, well, sure, if you want to, <laughs> you know. I told her, I said, I've been posting videos on YouTube, uh, ministry videos, for about two years or so. And in two years' time, I've gotten four donations in two years. And those four together didn't equal $100. But I'm thankful, I'm very thankful that anybody would want to donate anything to here. Every, every little bit counts, believe me. I do all this work on my own. All the electronics, the computers, the software, the camera, the editing software, uh, the research, all of this stuff I had to buy on my own, out of my own pocket. Before I started putting together the YouTube site, I had another site that was up for over 13 years, going on 14 years now. And in 14 years, I received zero donations from that site. But I continued to preach and teach the Bible. So if it's on your heart to donate something, as it was with this lady who had contacted me, feel free to do so. There's a donation link there on my YouTube page. If you're listening to this on my other ministry page, it'll be at the top. If you want to donate something, that'll be fine. And uh, I really appreciate it. Trust me. I work really hard to try to give you guys the best information, very documented, and try to help out wherever I can. And I really appreciate it. So I look forward to hearing from you guys. Thank you for watching the video. And until next we meet, may the grace of my God Jesus be with you. Good night, everybody.